This oral history with Neil Armstrong was conducted on September 19, 2001 for the Johnson Space Center Oral History Project in Houston, Texas. Interviewers were Dr. Stephen E. Ambrose and Dr. Douglas Brinkley. Assisting with the session were team members of the Johnson Space Center Oral History Project. So I just wanted to start a little bit about growing up in Ohio. And Ohio is an aviation um, state. And I read somewhere that you were very young and your father took you to the national air races in Cleveland. You, you were so young that you didn't know you I was two uh, the first time I went to the air races. And uh, of course, I have no, no recollection, recollection of that now. Did your father have an interest in flight? Is that why he, he would probably take you there? Or was it just in the air at that time that it was so exciting? I, I, don't, I don't think he had a particular interest in in flight. It was just uh, an opportunity to take children to new experiences, I guess. And that you got to ride in your first plane when you were age six, or um, in one of the four tri-motors, and Warren, do you have recollections, good recollections of that? I do not. You don't? No. no. When did you first hear of Lindbergh? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure as, uh, I, I can't remember when the first time was, but I'm sure it was when I was schoolboy in elementary yeah. school. And everybody in America knew. Yeah. But schoolboys talked about heroes of flight. <coughs> hmm. And you later have an opportunity to meet Lemmer, see somebody that was in, been in your mind. As, a, as an aviation, when you were becoming a pilot, thinking about Lindbergh, did, did he mean a great deal to you as an American icon? Or? Um, I did have the opportunity to meet him on several occasions. I had enormous admiration for him as a pilot. I read some of the some of his uh, books. Uh, I was aware of the controversial uh, position he took on certain issues. Uh, but uh, I, I was very pleased to have had the chance to meet him, and I think his, uh, his wife was uh, a wonderful person and a, quite a delicate writer. Yes. Did, did he give you a, a, did you ever correspond with him at the time of the Apollo? Was there any kind of wishing you well um, in, you know, before the Apollo 11 mission or something like a good, you know, Wishing you luck, sort of. Um, I, I, I can't recall that. I, I, I think I have some, some letters from him in my file, though. When did you f begin building things? Your interest in uh, your concern with engineering, your wanting to build things, is that a part of your memory from? When you were five or six years old, did you have a special bent towards uh, that? I began to focus on on aviation probably at age eight or nine, and uh, and inspired by uh, what I'd read and seen about aviation and the building of model aircraft, why I determined at an early age, and I don't know exactly what age, but while I was still in elementary school, that that was the field I wanted to go into, although my uh, my intention was to be, uh, or hoped was to be an aircraft designer. And I later went into to piloting because I thought a good designer ought to know the operational aspects of an airplane. Were you good in mathematics? Um, Everything's relative. I, I was uh, good in my small classes. Uh, however, uh, I've since met many people who have far better mastery of mathematics than I will ever have. Uh, what, did you have physics in high school? Yes, I did. Do you remember your teacher? Yes, he was John Kreitz. Remember him 
very well because he was sort of an unconventional teacher. And he allowed a few students in each of his class to to do special projects. And uh, so we didn't go to class very much. We were always off freaking on our projects. What was your project? Or uh, many, or whatever. In physics we had uh, two. Uh, one was uh, building a Tesla coil. Uh, I think it was probably about a 50,000 volt Tesla coil. But it was good enough to light up fluorescent bulbs in the next room. <laughs> and uh, then a wind tunnel, uh, which I, 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 that was my, that project was by myself, the Tesla coil I did with another, another student. Tell us about the wind tunnel. Um, well, I, my, uh, my knowledge of aerodynamics was uh, not good enough to uh, match the quality of the Wright Brothers Tunnel. <laughs> and, uh, I, and at that point, I suppose I was uh, equally educated to, to them. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a fun project. I uh, blew out a lot of fuses in my, my home <laughs> uh, because I tried to build a, a rheostat which would allow the electric motor to change speed and then get various air flows through the tunnel. Not altogether successfully. <laughs> During this period you were traveling around Ohio to a lot of different cities. Is there one, one beyond Wapakoneta, other cities that you really identified with or had? How many different schools? Do you have to go to different schools in all those different towns? Yeah, I went to one, two, three, huh? half a dozen schools. Yeah. Are you able to develop friendships with that when you're going to that many different schools or is it the pair of the family life? Uh, I'm certainly, I, I, I'm certain I have friendships in, in every one of the schools I was in, but uh, I don't remember those friends prior to uh, probably the junior high school uh, age. I still have friends of, that I see and remember from that time period and subsequent. Beyond your physics class and the projects, were you an avid reader and were you reading engineering and aerodynamics or history or what? I was an avid reader, avid reader yes. Uh, and I read uh, all kinds of things. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the library and took a lot of books out of the library on both fiction and nonfiction. Um, however, when when I was building things, like models and so on, they were, they were pre predominantly focused on aviation-related stuff. Do you remember any specific book you read about aviation that, wow, kind uh, of response? I, I, uh, I recall that <clears throat> Uh, I read a lot of the aviation magazines of the time, uh, flight and air trails and model airplane news and, and a anything that I could get my hands on. Oh. Yeah, what about like Robert Goodard and science fiction things about space? Were there, did you ever read any of the science fiction writers of that time? That um, as, as a young boy, I don't recall reading much science fiction. I, I did come to enjoy it uh, when I was perhaps late high school and and in college age. When you when you were very small, did, did you have any um, interest in Billy Mitchell's trial? I I don't recall. I knew the name Billy Mitchell, uh, and I knew about his demonstration of. Uh, the effectiveness of air power, but I don't recall uh, things about, about his trial. I may have known, but I don't remember. 
You were, what, a sophomore in high school when World War II ended? Uh, that's approximately, right, let's see, 47. Yeah, I, I was between uh, my sophomore and junior year. And the assumption among young men at that time was as soon as I graduate or as soon as I get to be 18, I'm going into the service. But then the war ended when you were 15. Mm -hmm. So you completed the high school without any I'm going to enlist kind of feeling. Uh, that's correct. We had uh, a few people in my school who had uh, either lied about their age or were a little bit older than their class who had gone into the service and came back and uh, finished high school after after the war was over. And we had several of those fellows in our, in our school. But uh, the youngest of those would probably be two years older than I yeah, was. Yeah. You got a Navy scholarship to Purdue uh, immediately after graduating high school, I gather. Um, I believe that the uh, the tests for the what was called the Holloway Plan, the Naval Aviation College Program, were administered nationwide while I was still in high school, probably shortly before graduation. Oh, but I cannot remember the precise date. Uh, it was early enough so that we could pick a school. If we if we were accepted into this program, we could pick any accredited school in the nation to. Attend. Was the test on one of those IBM sheets where you? You know, one, two, three, four, five, and you have a lead pencil, and you. I. I don't think so. Uh, I believe it was. Predominantly, uh, I shouldn't really say I, because I could confuse that. But I, I, my recollection is that it was a uh, uh, pen and pencil or a pen, pencil and paper. Uh, exam of, with a variety of different kinds of questions and sections. Mainly mathematics or yeah, mathematics and physics? physics I'm sure they had a, fo a focus on things that would be appropriate to aviation mm -hmm. because of an aviation directed program, but I can't remember the, the details of the test, except that I recall it was quite long. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by all day? Yeah, it was an all day test. That's the way they used to do it, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've been through that myself. So you came out well, obviously, and the Navy offered you on the Holly plan. Um, well, it was like Naval ROTC that you would get tuition and a stipend of twenty-five bucks a month or something like that. I suppose. Yeah, unfortunately, it was a little more than that. No. <laughs> uh, they they would pay uh, tuition fees and books. Yeah. Uh, plus a. Uh, They, they paid nothing while we were in school, but we were when we went to active duty. Then they paid seventy-five dollars a month. So when you accepted in this program, you were signing up, in effect. And uh, you were subject to a call program. from the Navy. Seven-year program, yes. Yeah. Uh, two years of active duty, then uh, go to the Navy, go through flight training, get a commission, and uh, then serve uh, in the regular Navy for. A total then of three years of active duty, after which uh, reach, the plan would be to return to university and finish your last two years. And the intent of this program, uh, named after Admiral Holloway, who I, if memory serves, was Wally Shiraz's father-in-law. Uh, mm. <laughs> and the intent was to build up the reserve, naval air reserve strength, which. Uh, they, they felt was uh, going downhill because people after the war didn't really want to do that stuff anymore. That was my, my understanding at the time. So you were called up for flight training after what, one year at Purdue or two a years? A year and a half. A year and a half? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be two years, but they 
So that was. I, 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 don't, I suppose they saw Creek coming or something. Yeah. And they, they needed to ratchet the volume up a little bit, so they called us in early. All right, so now you're in uniform, but not yet commissioned, being trained as a pilot. Is that correct? I was, yes, I was. Yeah. Naval Force. Tell me about training. How did the Navy go about training you? Well, they, uh, they, they found that the way I had learned to fly before wasn't nearly what they expected. So. <laughs> How did, just to backtrack for one second, how you got your pilot's license at age 16 uh, um, in Ohio. How did that, uh, even, was that a drive, was, could you have gotten it any earlier? Was that like almost getting an auto license back then at 16, what, where you're 14, 15, you're dying? You can, you, I believe you could get it in a glider at age 14, but in a powered aircraft you, you had to wait till you were, you reach your 16th birthday before, and then the license you got was called a student pilot's license, which allowed you to fly solo, but not take passengers with you. Do you remember your first solo flight over your the land in Ohio when you actually could be up in the air on your own? Do you have any recollections of that? Um, yeah, I I have vague recollections of where, where very was that exciting flight? time when you're where was going the, your first solo. Where was the location? It was in Wapakoneta. And from Wapakoneta. Mm -hmm. Out of grass field there. Who was your first instructor? Oh, let's see. I had three. And those, and uh, The first one's name escapes me at the minute. Then the second one was named Aubrey Nudegaard, and the, and the third was uh, Chuck Finkenby. Do they live to that area in at, in Wabakan area? They all lived in. All the, not, I, I don't know where they live, but I'm sure they didn't live far. Was far it away. unusual for a, a young man your age, or a lot of contemporaries of yours, that from wanting to get pilot's license, where you kind of I, I was in a class of uh, maybe about 70 students and uh, half, about half boys, and we had three in my class that uh, learned to fly at the same time I did. Okay. So I don't know how unusual that is. Three out of 35, 10 percent. Not very unusual. Before we get back to the name cast, one Ohio question. Just because, how many, I'm curious because living in Ohio, what, do you remember the number, the, the towns that you lived in? Often it says you lived in a lot of different towns, but I'm never, they never I, say the names of them. I moved a lot before I entered school. And when I entered school, the rate of change of towns slowed down somewhat, but still about every couple of years it seemed like we were moving. What, what were the names of some of the other towns besides? I started school. First school was in uh, in uh, Warren, Ohio, and then Jefferson, Ohio, and uh, <coughs> Alton, Ohio, and then St. Mary's, Ohio, and then Wapakoneta, Ohio. Yeah, that's I never knew of those other towns. Thank you. Okay, when you began with the. Uh, the Navy is training you to be a pilot. You had been up in a single engine plane for some soloing, and, but now you're with the United States Navy, and how did they train you? Um, training was divided into three parts. The first was a uh, three-month non-flying ground school and physical training regimen. And the second part was uh, called basic training, which was all, all flight students went through the exact same protocol, did the exact same kinds of things. Learning to fly, <clears throat> getting some experience soloing, uh, learning to do cross-country flight, navigation, and that sort of thing. 
learning to fly instruments, learning to fly acrobatics, learning to fly formation, learning to drop bombs, learning to fire guns, and learning to land on aircraft carrier. After that, went to advanced training where... On an actual carrier or... On a real carrier. On a real carrier. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, the, the advanced training, you went to uh, hopefully the the branch of the Naval Air Force that you wanted, but more likely the branch of the Naval Air Force that the Navy wanted you to go to. In my case, I asked for fighters and got fighters. So I went, then you, we went to uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and went through through training there in uh, single passing single cockpit single occupant air, aircraft, uh, in my case, F-8F, Bearcat. And uh, we went through s sort of the same kinds of things, learning to fly it uh, and on instruments and learning to uh, do advanced navigation, over water navigation, and uh, stop, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> stop and say, Navigation by the stars, or navigation by radio, or navigation by compass, or what? We we did had <coughs> learned in uh, in the earlier part, uh, the first sector, the, the ground school part, uh, how how to navigate, use celestial navigation. It turned out that uh, those celestial navigation was used by multi-engine pilots predominantly. Uh, well, single single engine fighters and attack aircraft uh, required the full attention of the sole occupant on the flying, and so he couldn't be taking sextant shots and things like that. So the the uh, the navigation was somewhat more rudimentary, but it required dead reckoning and use of radio aids and whatever might be available uh, at sea. Uh, Excuse determining me, how do you dead reckon at sea? By by computing your your true speed over the ground, by uh, you can, using your airspeed, altitude, and outside temperature, uh, and noting the direction of the wind, however you could by wave wave action or cloud shadow movements. Guessing, Thinking, in other guessing. Words. Uh, uh, at least you'd hopefully be in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> Probably weren't always, but and uh, then the, the pilots had to be able to return to their carrier. So uh, there were certain kinds of uh, <coughs> electronic aids uh, that were peculiar to a carrier you wouldn't find anywhere else, and wouldn't find in land-based navigation. So it was a matter of learning those, and of course learning to uh, use the aircraft as a weapon and defensively and offensively and learn tactics and and then finally uh, qualify again on a carrier in, in uh, advanced aircraft which which was the normal part the other students went into multi-engine flight and either patrol bombers or or uh, or transports or you know some variety of other craft and they went everyone went their separate ways Mm. In the Army Air Forces in 1942, 43, 44, only the very best got to be fighter pilots. If you weren't quite up to that standard, then they put you in a two-engine or a four-engine. But is, was that also true in the Navy? The fighter I mean, I'm not asking you. The fighter pilots always said that I was I'm true, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know what the what the naval naval officers. Uh, the commanding officer of the training command would say about that, because I was not privy to what process they used in deciding. My, my own guess is that a large part of it uh, had to do with what needs they had at the time yeah. you graduated. Because uh, 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 in, in my particular cl class, most of my classmates happened to get uh, what they asked for, while I can recall people from a different generation saying nobody got what they asked for, yeah. so I, I, I can't, uh, I, I can't really know. I, I've read that you told your mother you didn't want to be responsible for others. That's why you wanted a 
single engine fighter. Is that story accurate? Uh, I, I don't know that I ever told her that. I, you know, I might have said something like that, but I, I don't remember saying it. And w and when did you get your wings in commission? What was the date? I got my wings in uh, August of 1950, and uh, but that was about 17 or 18 months after I had begun my my active duty service, so I still had another uh, six months to go, so I was one of those rare birds, a uh, midshipman with wings. Uh, and uh, so I was, uh, went, to, went, went to the fleet squadron, was in a standby unit for a while, and then, and then assigned to a jet fighter squadron. Uh, Still with, the, still as a midshipman making seventy-five bucks a month plus flight pay. Fifty percent of uh, seventy-five bucks. Was landing on the uh, landing on carriers at night? I mean, is that, that was very extraordinarily difficult to learn. And was there one aspect of this period where it was the hard thing for you to to conquer something we, like that? We, I, I happen to be a day fighter pilot. We had night fighter pilots. And, you know, on, on the ship I was on, and uh, I thought they were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever have to do a night landing? Uh, I did it only in practice. I never did it on a carrier. All my landings on a carrier were in day. I was always happy about that. So August of 50, and the Korean War is now a couple of months old. Yeah, it just started. Yeah. And you're completing your basic, mm -hmm. and did they send you right off? Um, I asked for uh, the Pacific Fleet, and uh, and what was given the Pacific Fleet. And but as they say, I, I went was first sent out to a squadron called Fazron Fleet Air Service Squadron, which is a utility squadron handled all kinds of. Uh, miscellaneous jobs that needed to be done around a large naval air station. And that sort of was a holding position. They would typically take new entrants that come to that base and stick them there for a time period until there was a squadron open, opening for them to, for assignment. And uh, so I was in that squadron for probably three or four months uh, until there was an opening for me in uh, Fighter Squadron 51. And that would have been at the end of 1950? That was the end of 50. Mm -hmm. November or December, as I remember. And then off to the fleet? Yeah, we immediately uh, prepared to uh, be assigned to uh, to the uh, Korean action, and uh, so it was a matter of the squadron training everyone in an operational sense to do the job that they would be expected to do. So that that period, again, you sort of do the same sorts of things as you did in training. Now you're in a new aircraft, but you have a more, much more specific objective because you sort of know what, what kind of an environment you're going into. Uh, we didn't know whether, to what extent we would be offensive in the sense that we would be uh, be dropping bombs or shooting guns or, or to what extent we might be defending the fleet against uh, Chinese or Russian incoming aircraft, to what extent it might be air to air or air to ground. or you know. So we had to pre prepare for sort of all of those, plus become carrier qualified in the, in the jet aircraft and doing a lot of practice uh, with weapons delivery, instrument uh, flying and so on, the, the things that would we, we would be face, facing when we got an operation. Yeah, I was very young, very green. But I, you were very young. I uh, it. Which coast of Korea were you on when you flew your first mission? We were all the uh, all the time we flew off the eastern coast of North Korea, off uh, Wonsan Bay, 
about a hundred miles out, something like that, and almost all. We had two kinds of flights. Uh, one would be uh, co called combat air patrol, which was uh, defense of the fleet, basically, and the other was predominantly interdiction flights, flying against bridges and railroads and trying to the find bombs location and to take bombs and bullets. Bombs, or? bullets and, and rockets and, and rockets. sometimes depending on what target was. We had a combination of two fighter two jet fighter squadrons, uh, F four U Corsair Squadron and an A D uh, squadron that could carry the, the two thousand pounders and uh, really do some damage. Seven in a squadron? There were uh, in I can't speak specifically to the numbers in each squadron. In our squadron, we had 24 pilots and 16 aircraft. 16. But only 24 pilots. Mm -hmm. We started with 24. Started with, yeah. The Army liked to have two pilots for every airplane. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your first mission. Uh, I can't. I can't recall it. Well, I know you did a lot of them, and so did you ever, in, in flying combat air patrol, did, did they ever come in and try to attack the fleet at night? No, and I'm or glad they by didn't. air? No, they, <laughs> no I, I would not have enjoyed trying to go, well, I probably would have enjoyed it, but I don't know that I could have won against the MiG and the old Panther it was a pretty primitive airplane. Of course, the MiG was pretty primitive too, but... Had a little better performance. How did the F-9 Panther perform? In the US? Well, it's a very solid airplane. Uh, we thought it was uh, wonderful. In retrospect, uh, it was it was an airplane of the time, and and it didn't, uh, it didn't fly. Uh, Nearly as well as uh, as it as we would have liked it to fly, but we didn't know that at the time. Looking back, we can say that. What were the weak weak points? It didn't have particularly good handling clout, handling qualities. Uh, it's uh, pretty good lateral directional controls, but very stiff in pitch. And uh, it, its performance, both in uh, absolute altitude. Max speed and climb rate were uh, inferior to uh, the MiG by a substantial amount. And had you been, had you received, there's a story about September 3rd, 1951, when you had to eject yourself from a Panther after receiving anti aircraft fire. Was that one of the moments of the Korean War that's really, you know, sort of, you really feel your life is being put on the line for you? Now, do you remember that one? <laughs> you do remember it was that? an anti-aircraft fire, though. Although anti-aircraft fire was ubiquitous at the time, and I don't know to what extent that uh, anti-aircraft fire played a part in it. But I actually ran through a cable, an anti-aircraft cable, and knocked off about six or eight feet of my right wing. Very, if you're going fast, <laughs> that, uh, the cable will make a very good knife. And what happened at that point? Well, I didn't think that uh, that I could uh, risk slowing the airplane down to landing speed because you must once have been perfect, almost right on the deck. Uh, well, it was these are strung between mountains, so I, you know, I was up maybe 500 feet or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, not not an unusual altitude for the kind of things we were doing. I, I don't remember exactly what the yeah. altitude was, but they they didn't uh, put those. Uh, those big balls on the cables uh, so that you could see they were there in those days. Well, you, and you ended up being, what happened after that moment then you... you well, I, uh, I was, I was uh, flying on the wing of uh, John Carpenter, who was an Air Force major on exchange program with us, and uh, we decided not to try to, uh, we talked it over and decided not to try to land it because uh, if I got slow, and uh, a little bit too slow and started to snap why I would have no ability to control it after that. And uh, so consequently decided it'd be better to uh, jump out. So 
took it down south uh, into friendly territory and jumped out in the Bohem in the vicinity of Pohang Airport K3, which was operated by Marines, U.S. Marines. Could you eject or did you jump? I ejected. I had a the old style uh, shotgun shell powered ejection seat, 22 GC. And were you always wearing the parachute or did you have to put it on? Oh, we, we always had it. You always had it. Yeah. Yeah, all Strapped under the swallow of your back. Exactly. Had you had any parachute training? Uh, no, we had not, but uh, we had uh, one of the, one of the uh, gentlemen uh, in the squadron, one of my classmates, actually, uh, was assigned to collateral duty of being the uh, equipment and escape officer. And so he went through, uh, went over to parachute school, as I remember, in El Centro, California and uh, came back and told us how to do it, <laughs> if, if the need it ever arose. Did you get rescued quickly once you landed with no problem? Yeah, yeah, the Jeep dro drove up as I was, uh, just as I was landing from, from K3. Happened to be a, the driver was a roommate of mine in flight school. They were really? where? In flight school. Oh, it was now a Marine lieutenant operating out of that field. What was his name? His name was Goodell Warren. Goodell Warren. And, the, um, and did you ever, during the war, receive other heavy damage flying, you know, from ground fire? Mm, we always, yeah, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of bullet holes in our airplanes when we brought them back. And we'd patch them up. And Put a little duct tape over that yeah. hole. And they made them look pretty good. Painted over. Uh, after, no, after your first month, but on the Essex, then you would get, you have Liberty in Japan, would you get to spend time? Usually, uh, you yeah, know, usually we'd spend four or five weeks at sea, and and then they would take the entire ship back uh, to Yokosuka for a week of refurbishing and uh, uh, reprovisioning and things like that. We did some, about one day a week, we did some reprovisioning at sea, a few little armament, and, uh, but, uh, on a monthly basis or five weeks or something like that, we'd go back in for five days or six days, something like that. You could get aviation gasoline while you were at sea? Or when you say fuel, you mean fuel for the carrier? Uh, you know, I don't really know uh, mm -hmm. what all kinds of fuel they, but they had a pipe they could, uh, a hose that they could put over from the provisioning ship to the carrier, and uh, I assumed that uh, they had all kinds of, both uh, diesel and, and jet fuel, but I, and, and maybe uh, Afghans too. Tell me about weather. North Korea, the whole of Korea, is notorious for bad weather, and you're doing interdiction runs, mm -hmm. so the weather is critical. Did yeah. you ever go off on a mission and you just couldn't find the target? And you got, could you land with the carrying bombs? Uh, no, we, we... Or you jettisoned them in the sea? We would usually uh, jettison armaments prior to uh, returning, and we tried to jettison on on the targets of opportunity. At the mm -hmm. end of the at the end of the flight, when we uh, had had uh, either found or not found our primary target, due to in some cases weather. It, normally, we'd have alternates. So if some if there was weather. We would go, we would divert to another mm. target, and we had some uh, weather in, uh, information, uh, which because we had Allied forces in the south of Korea, and we had other sources of information, so they were able to give us a, a not a bad weather briefing of what we could expect in the target area. It wasn't always right, just like it isn't always right here. Mm -hmm. uh, How did the sort of teamwork and camaraderie you experienced on the Essex with Hey, did, is there any way to compare that at all to being in the astronaut corps or with engineers and contractors of the space program? I guess I'm getting at the, the concept of teamwork now. Is it, it, it something that's almost became a big part of your life at that, from this point on? What was the teamwork upon the Essex? Um, yeah, it was teamwork operations. Certainly, uh, we had very few 
uh, occasions when we would do anything on a solo basis. Uh, almost everything we did as teams, and usually in our case, we usually liked flights of four at least. Uh, help each other out. Uh, eight eyes are better than two uh, in looking for for trouble. A diamond looking for formation targets. with the four. We used a formation. Uh, uh, usually uh, um, a echelon two airplanes each separated by probably uh, a quarter to a half mile. That would allow us uh, to see a broad pro panorama both to the rear yeah. of the other. We would be looking after their tail and they would be looking after ours. Uh, that was uh, uh, a different approach than had been earlier uh, introduced, or at least uh, uh, attributed to Jimmy Thatch, uh, so-called Thatch mm, Weave, right. which we did not we did not use that technique. Can you characterize your Air Group Commander Marsh BB and your, your Squadron Leader EM Bouchamp? Did they have a big impact on you, teaching you, and, and were you, did you get to learn from them? New ways of flight that you hadn't previously learned in your, your training and you know, on the job training on the SX? I flew with Commander BB some uh, and uh, thought he was quite a good air group commander. It was the first I'd, I'd known and certainly the first in any operational circumstances or any, any uh, combat circumstances. So. Uh, I wasn't in a position to be critical anyway. I was one inexperienced to a junior officer, and and uh, I was I was delighted when I had the chance to fly with him. Ernie Beecham, a wonderful a skipper, uh, had enormous respect for him. I thought he was was and is he is alive to, today. Uh, a superior uh, superior leader, and. Uh, I think if there was anything I learned from uh, from our skipper, it was that it's uh, not how you look, it's uh, how you perform. Do you stay in touch with any of the men from a unit, or do they stay in touch with you? Or if we, have, we, have, we have periodic reunions, yes. Do you ever attend any of those? Or have you ever I was at one, one two months ago. Oh, were you ready? And it's it. They must be very proud of following your work with Apollo and you know, words. But I guess for them, you're just another one of the crew. They've, they've forgiven me for my errors. <laughs> <laughs> so you fin came home from Korea, and you would completed your obligatory time in the Navy and you went right back to Purdue to finish school. Yeah. Is that Actually right? my time expired uh, when I was uh, flying off the Essex and so uh, my options were to uh, either extend or swim home. <laughs> so I extended. <laughs> this is a kind of question I, I, I always sense you may not like but the Air Group 5's operation became the basis for the Venture's book, The uh, Bridges of Tokyo Rock. Have you read the book? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you like mm -hmm. it? I, think, I thought it was uh, an excellent representation of the kinds of, of flying that, that uh, we were doing there. It was in the identical same kind of aircraft and the same class carrier. They put in, uh, they put girls in the movie, which uh, I didn't remember from my <laughs> experience. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, actually, Michener was on our ship. Uh, oh I think my. he went out three tours, Ooh. two or three tours. At, you know, at four or five weeks at a crack, and he would just sit around the the ward room in the evening or the ready, ready room in the daytime and listen to guys tell the actual stories. He didn't ask question much or anything. He just kind of absorbed, absorbed it all. And so most of the things that happened in the, in the book, which is quite a different book from any other books he's, he's written in many ways, 
were, were actual events. Maybe he strung them together with different characters so they didn't happen precisely the way it would be would been described in his his novel, but nevertheless they were basically uh, all tr all adaptations of true stories that he, he used. Can you uh, can you recognize yourself in any of the, those as a founder? Mm, no, but I uh, uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, was named uh, Leonard Cheshire, Chet we called him. Uh, he, he did not, uh, he wasn't, didn't return. But I believe that, uh, I, I believe there's a lot of Ch Cheshire stories in Bridges at Tokarine. In the time you did spend in Japan, do you have any memories of well, your time in Japan? Or there's the boy from Ohio going really to a foreign country and experiencing Japanese life? Is there any uh, we, we usually went to, uh, these R and R facilities that the Navy had been had had organized and set up for our use, we went to the Fujia Hotel uh, a, a number of times. It's in the in the uh, sh shadow of Mount Fuji. So, um, how did it feel then to? Uh, I, well, here's a question for me. Did you feel? Your time in the Korean War, which gets talked about as the Forgotten War and things. I mean, to you, that when you were doing duty for the country, you weren't questioning the politics involved in any way with the Cold War on? Um, I, the, the, uh, the naval aviators that, that I knew first were determined to do a first, uh, a first class job. Uh, second, most of them really enjoyed the combat experience in, in many ways. They'd rather be flying than not be flying. And lastly, they questioned everything. They talk around. They talk about the, the Korean action and the reasons for things and why 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 certain targets might be available and others not be available and you know that's th things that I, I suppose uh, military people uh, it's the kind of questions they've asked themselves and talked among themselves and throughout history you're very much involved in in the in the in the experience and uh, and questioning is part of the natural thing to do When you returned to civilian, were you excited to return from civilian life after the war, get on with, you know, getting back to going to Purdue and back to finishing your college degree? Well, but you must have been older now, right? Going back to the war experience, back to college. Another, were you now, suddenly you're one yeah, of the youngest pilots. I was 22. No, I was really 22. getting old. Yeah. <laughs> old man. <laughs> I was, when I went back to university. Kids look so young. <laughs> it, it, did you have a decision to make or did you always think I'm going back to Purdue and I'm going to finish this degree um, well there were tempting options uh, and uh, but stay I in the Navy for a while to stay in the Navy or, yeah. or, or otherwise <laughs> use the skills that the Navy had uh, taught me and those opportunities showed up periodically but I, I thought it was Im important to uh, go back and finish my education so I put that in the first position. And then you started joining the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics mm -hmm. at that point and you went to, uh, did you then move to Cleveland? I did. And you, you that was my first job out of college. Yeah. Room, and that was with the Lewis Flight. Laboratory. Right. Did you just rent an apartment on your own, or what, how did you? I uh, I rented a room at first in a private home, and later uh, met uh, one of the other young bachelor engineers there, and we and then we we rented a uh, a small a small place at uh, 
for the two of us. Was this close to the laboratory or in downtown Cleveland? Or well, it was. Uh, it was not far from them. Uh, I don't think we were more than ten minutes from from work. And did you require an automobile? Did you yeah, I had an automobile. Mm -hmm. And so you can go back home too. So from Cleveland, Wapa, Connecticut, or to visit family. And I could, yeah. You returned back. Um, how? What did you? What were your general duties and responsibilities there at the laboratory in Cleveland? Um, I. I had a, a dual job as a research pilot and a research engineer. Actually, I think at that point they called them research scientists. Uh, and uh, the, the flying involved uh, doing work with the new anti-icing systems for aircraft in which we uh, had a, a C C-47 or R-4D or DC-3 on, with various kinds of anti-icing equipment that we would fly over out in the worst weather we could find out over Lake Erie and try to pick up a lot of ice and then find out which were the most efficient ways of shedding it. Uh, we also did some work in uh, high Reynolds number, high Mach number heat transfer, and, uh, and this uh, this project involved flying a F-82, which was a twin Mustang, and uh, go, flying out to the Atlantic Ocean and going to high altitude and launching a multi-stage rock, rocket <coughs> downward into the atmosphere to get very high Mach numbers at very uh, low altitudes and therefore very high heat transfer rates. And when the nose of the nose cone was instrumented to measure those those kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, I did a lot of work in that area also as on my my scientist or engineer job in analyzing that data and also designing components for advanced versions of the rockets that we were using to fire in those days. But I wasn't there long, and uh, I'd originally applied to uh, Edwards for my first job. They didn't have a spot. Unbeknownst to me, they had transferred my application to the other NACA laboratories, uh, and, uh, and it was as a result of that that the Lewis Laboratory uh, talked to me about coming up there and taking a, a filling an opening that they had when it was the lowest paying job that I was offered uh, coming out of college, but uh, I think uh, in retrospect it was the right one. Were there any memorable incidents or things that occurred while at your time at Cleveland applying? <coughs> Were there any new things in your mind that you'd say, I want to have an opportunity to test this? I want to, I mean, were you anxious to try with all the technology changing so quickly in aviation? Were you wanting always to be uh, where the newest research was being done? The only, the only product of the NACA was research reports and papers. And so when you uh, prepared something for publication, either as a principal or associate author of some sort, you had to face the Inquisition, which was the review of such said paper by experts who were predominantly lady English teachers or librarians who were absolutely unbearably critical of a tiniest punctuation or grammatical error. And that is what NASA needs today. <laughs> because it really made a good product. Uh, and the rigor of the language was, which I never mastered, but I appreciated after being exposed to those charming ladies, ladies who are so tough. 
I know exactly what you mean. That's my wife <laughs> that you're talking about. <laughs> and I get asked, what's the secret to being a successful writer? And I say, marry an English major. <laughs> Cleveland. Did you drive then from Cleveland to California with, with your car? When you I did. Mm -hmm. And you're married this time, so you're driving together. For, I was not married. Not no. Married then. No. So did you made it, was that one of your first cross country trek seeing the Rockies? And no, no, America? because I had driven. Uh, uh, I, I I first got my car when I was in the Navy, so I had driven from the West Coast <coughs> across the country before. And where, to and from. And where did you, you go immediately when you went to California? What was your destination city? You're going to Edwards? Edwards, yeah. But you're also eventually going to the University of Southern California? To, yeah, that, that was later. later. Yeah. That was later. Yeah, I went directly to my, my job at, uh, at Edwards. So you started flying X-15s when you got there? Well, at the time, uh, I went I went there uh, in f 55, summer of 55, and uh, the X-15 was just put under contract in November of 55. It wouldn't be completed for four years later. So what were your first projects there when you got to, to uh, I have to look in my logbook to be be sure. Uh, first, they wanted me to uh, learn a little bit of the NACA techniques for data collection and so on, and they had a P-51 that uh, they had very rudimentary instruments and, and data collection techniques for, and they spent, made me go out there and do a lot of flights and practice a lot of uh, maneuvers for test purposes to uh, <coughs> and turn in the results and so they could see whether I was starting to get the hang of it. It took me a while, but that was good. Did I hear you say P-51? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that plane. Oh, it's no F-8F, but it's not a bad airplane. Well, I, I was interviewing one of the Tuskegee Airmen who flew P-51s in Italy, and he said, that was such a honey of an airplane. If it had been a girl, I'd have married it. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is a nice airplane. It had wonderful sound, particularly when you retarded the throttle and you got those stacks putt, 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 putting. It was, was quite quite elegant. And uh, I, I enjoyed flying the airplane. It just didn't have the performance of an F-8F, which, uh, but it was built to be a, a high altitude. Well, at first it was built to be an attack airplane, not a fighter, but yeah. the fighter version of it yeah. uh, became predominantly a high-altitude escort, long-range aircraft. So, continue with... Oh, other airplanes. Uh, they uh, flew uh, some other jets. They had a YRF 84F and uh, had a, uh, we had, uh, when I got there, only I was the fifth pilot. One was going to leave. Uh, Scott Crossfield had announced that he was going to go be, be the pilot on the X-15 program. Whoever won it, he was going to go there and had agreements with all the different bidders that if they won the contract, he would get the job. So told him he was going to leave, and that's what gave me the opportunity to transfer there. Uh, they had five, five pilots. and. I, if, I, if memory serves, 17 aircraft, pretty much all different. A lot of X airplanes and fighters and a B-47 and a <coughs> R-40 and a couple of B-29s and very all, all kinds of exotic aircraft. So uh, they, you know, they let me fly a few of these at first and as they became uh, more confident of uh, my abilities and as I became more experienced, why they gave me more and more jobs, and I did a lot of different uh, test programs in, in those days. Uh, first, that, that was the first time I ever flew supersonically when I got an F-100, uh, 
and I flew that aircraft a lot, a very nice early F-100. And you flew a B-29. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, a, that's a big plane. Yeah. We had two that we used for dropping rocket aircraft, the X-1s and the Skyrockets. And uh, so uh, I either as, as the right seat or the left seat guy in the B-29 launched over 100 uh, rocket airplanes in the 50s. A couple of your X-15 flights become pretty well known. Um, one in which you lost your stability and had to recover. And then there's also the mission which you ended with the longest X-15 uh, flight on record when you had to fly mm -hmm. back to Edwards from the south. Do you mind just commenting on a couple of those, particularly those two flights? Um, they, I can remember several different system problems in the flights, you almost always had something. Uh, and I can't recall the details of, of uh, the SAS, SAS out problems. I could, if I, I would have it in my notes someplace, but I don't have it in memory. The uh, second flight was a uh, uh, an altitude flight. I, I was doing the, uh, I'd done a lot of the development work on a, a new type of flight control system that was installed in the number three aircraft and different from the, the ones in number one and number two. And uh, that system was developed by Minneapolis Honeywell in Minneapolis and I would go up there and fly an F-101 they had outfitted with a prototype version of this system. It, because the X-15 covered such a wide speed range and altitude range, it was impossible to set the gains in the flight control system to a single value uh, that was optimum for all flight conditions. And the one and two airplanes, you had to continually be changing the gains because at one minute you're at Mach 1 and the next minute you're at Mach 5 and the airplane responds quite differently in those two conditions. So you were continually having to do this. So we were looking to, to see if we could develop a system that would avoid that requirement of continually changing gains. So the Minneapolis Honeywell uh, system was was designed and built for the number three X-15. In addition to automatically changing the gains by very tr unique and uh, complex, even surprising method, which I won't won't burden you with. Uh, in addition to that, it would blend the aerodynamic and the reaction controls when you're outside the atmosphere. So, uh, in the one and two airplanes, when you're in the atmosphere, you flew with the regular center stick, and when you're outside the atmosphere, you flew with the reaction controls on the with a separate stick on the left side. With this system, we, we, we hope to be able to be able <coughs> to fly the same way all the time with one stick. Uh, this partic particular flight you mentioned too, we went to uh, somewhat above 200,000 feet, well outside the atmosphere, so that we were completely flying on, air on reaction controls up there. Aerodynamic controls were completely ineffective. It's like flying in a vacuum. And then we had a system uh, limit built in, into the flight control system that would automatically prevent you from exceeding 5 Gs. If you hit 5 Gs, it would automatically uh, keep put, put controls in to, to hold it below 5 Gs. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, demonstrate that that part of the system worked. It had never been yet demonstrated in flight. It was my responsibility to do that. Uh, and we, we tried this many times in the simulator with, uh, without any difficulty. But when we really did it in flight, we couldn't, I couldn't get the G limiter to work. I could kick in. So I was fiddling around with it, trying to 
keep pulling, tr try to get the G limiter to work on it. In the process, I got uh, the nose up above the horizon. And this had, we'd done this in the simulator, we'd never had any problem with it. But I found when I, when I uh, did it in real flight, what I was actually you know, skipping outside of the atmosphere again, where the I had no aerodynamic controls. What, that was not a particular problem because I still had reaction controls to use. But what I couldn't do is get back down in the atmosphere. I had no ability to, to I pulled over and pulled down and tried to pull out of the atmosphere, but it wasn't going down because there was no air to bite into. So I just had to wait until uh, I got back in with enough air to uh, have aerodynamic control and some lift on the wings and immediately started making a, a, a turn back. But by that time I'd gone well south of, of Edwards and, and it wasn't clear at the time I made the turn whether I would be able to get back to Edwards. Uh, that wasn't a great concern to me because there are other dry lakes available there that I, I wouldn't want to go into another one, but I certainly would if I needed to. But when we got back, I could see that we were going to make it uh, back to Edwards. And uh, so I landed without incident on the, on the south part of the lake. Did you have to glide in at that point? You always do. Always do. Yeah, there's, there's no power on the aircraft, so you're, you're always a glider after the rocket burns out. The rocket only lasted a minute and a half. Did that kind of, this sort of, did any of these difficulties you had at Edwards later with Dave Scott, Gemini, did any of these experiences teach you kind of grace under pressure or when you had the later problems with um, Mr. Scott and Gemini, did any, I mean, how does did these things? Well, I always felt that uh, we, the risks that we had in the space side of the program were probably less than we, we were back in, the, in, in flying at Edwards or the general flight test community. The reason is that uh, when we were out exploring the frontiers, we were, we were out, out at the edges of the flight envelope all the time testing, uh, testing limits. And, and our knowledge base was probably not as good as it was in the space program. We had less technical insurance, less mines looking, less, less uh, backup programs, less other analysis going on. So uh, that isn't to say that we didn't expect risks in the space program. We, we certainly expected they would be there, uh, would guarantee that they would be there. But uh, we felt pretty comfortable because we had so much technical backup that, and we weren't we we didn't go close nearly close to the limits as much as we did back in the old flight test days. Oh. I, hmm. Have you ever read the uh, in a, in a, if you like commenting on it, uh, Tom Wolf's The Right Stuff? Do you feel it's uh, captured the, the climate around Edwards in any way, shape, or form, or is it exaggerated? Or? Um, I haven't read the book critically. I'm not sure I've read it all. I've read a bit. I, I, I did see the movie. I, that was very good film making, but terrible history. The wrong people working on the wrong projects at the wrong <laughs> times, and it just bear no no resemblance whatever to what was actually going on. And it, to live out around Edwards at that time, you would you live right near the base. Or just I lived there. about uh, an hour drive away south. Nobody lived close. A half hour is about as close as you could live. Big base. You miss, at this point in your life, when you're telling all these stories to us, do you miss the opportunity of flying in that kind of way that, you know, on a regular basis, like you were doing back then? Does it get, sometimes you almost get nostalgic for those days at all? You know, so those were, that was a very exciting uh, job. Um, very excellent flying, very challenging goals. Uh, I, I think it was, uh, you know, one, certainly one of the memorable parts of my life. Like when you flew in today, do you ever sit on the airplane and think, God, I wish I could pilot this? I got the itch, like I feel like I wish I could just sit in the 
Is that yeah. I, I, I'm, st I'm still a legal pilot, and so I still enjoy it as much as I always did. Do you guys want to take a quick break for a few minutes? Sure. Had, we were out at um, Edwards, and I just wonder if you could comment um, on um, the Air Force's dinosaur program and how did you decide upon the Douglas F5D1 Skylancer as a suitable uh, demonstrator for parts of the dinosaur flight profile? And did you really develop any, did you develop um, any procedures based on flying this aircraft? No, yeah, I did. Uh, the dinosaur program, of course, was in, first intended to be a high hypersonic but non-orbital vehicle uh, and predominantly a research vehicle. And it was originally scheduled to be launched on the Titan I. Uh, it later became obvious that Titan II might be available and be a better choice, and that gave increased performance but still not, not orbital. Uh, then, uh, when the Titan III was uh, introduced, or looked like it was going to be introduced with uh, additional rocket engines strapped on the side of the of the liquid, solids strapped on the side of the liquids, why it might be a, an orbital vehicle, and if it would be orbital, why it could be an operational craft, and the Air Force savored the idea of having an operational spacecraft and uh, having their own space program, manned space program, separate from from NASA, and so uh, the project grew and grew. Eventually, uh, was not continued. It was it was canceled, perhaps because it grew too much. Uh, the uh, the launch, uh, unlike. Uh, Unlike the Mercury and Gemini and so on, was a winged winged vehicle on top, and there was a question as to what kind of abort techniques would be practical to try to use uh, in case there was a problem with the launch vehicle, a fire, say, in the launch vehicle in the Titan. And uh, it was determined to put a rather than a puller rocket, a pusher rocket, to push the spacecraft up to flying speed from which it could make a uh, landing, but it wasn't known at that time what might be practical and how much thrust would be needed and how much performance would be needed. And uh, we had the F-5D aircraft, which I determined would ha could be configured to have a similar glide angle or left drag ratio to the dinosaur for uh, similar flight conditions. And uh, and devised a way of of uh, flying the aircraft to the point at which the the uh, pusher escape rocket would burn out. So you would start with the identical flight conditions that the dinosaur would find itself after on a, a rocket abort from from the launch pad. So then establishing that initial condition, you only had to work out a way to find, uh, find your way to the runway and make a successful landing. And uh, I worked on that project for, for a time and, and found a technique that would allow us to uh, launch from the pad at, at uh, Cape Canaveral and make a landing on the, on the skid strip. Uh, there are the, not the shuttle landing strip, but the old skid strip. And uh, we practiced that. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, Bill Dane and Noel Thompson both continued uh, after I transferred from Edwards to uh, Houston uh, and continued that uh, program. And there was a, uh, a NASA report written uh, about the technique. Was, it was a practical method. I wouldn't like to have to really do it in, in a real, real dinosaur. But. What other um, responsibilities did you have at the High Speed Flight Center other than being a test pilot? Did they make, or was that you know, the other? Our principal responsibility was engineering work. Uh, we did, did not do a lot of flying. 
uh, was program development, devising simulations, looking at, at the problems of flight and uh, trying to figure out ways we could test those things and devise solutions to those problems. And uh, it, was, it's, it was a wonderful uh, time period and uh, it was very satisfying work, particularly when you find a solution that would, would work. Or did, did you know about the first call for astronauts that went out to military test pilots? And I was wondering what your thoughts may have been when you learned about the astronaut program when you first started realizing it. Oh, we were certainly uh, aware of it, both the, through NASA, because NACA had become NASA by, by this time, and, uh, and also from our colleagues in the military, uh, good friends and people we flew with uh, daily who were, some, some of whom had been invited to, uh, to uh, consider applying for that. Did you, when you were at Edwards, um, or did you develop close friendship with other astronauts or with people that later did you develop personal, did you stay more to yourself in your own life, or did you guys all socialize in a kind of... Uh, well, I knew uh, uh, a number of the, uh, of the Air Force people at Edwards who, who uh, later became uh, transferred to Houston like I did. Uh, but I wouldn't say that I knew them very well, uh, not nearly as well as I knew the other NASA pilots and, and NASA engineers for that matter. They were on a different part of the base. We occasionally had meetings where we would, would, uh, would be discussing the same subjects and uh, we would see them probably more frequently in the air when they were uh, out on our wingtip on F-104 or something. In this period, the notion of space uh, 50s is starting to be talked about. NASA is officially now NASA and their Eisenhower administrations. What you have any thoughts on some of the early events of the space race, such as the launch of Sputnik? Do you remember your feeling of hearing about Sputnik and um, you know, you know, Explorer One? These were you conscious of the politics of the Cold War going on with, with the race into space at that time when you were at Edwards? Well, Before it was Dryden, before yeah. it was Flight Research Center, it was called uh, high, NACA High Speed Flight Station. And they were working on the problems of high speed, high altitude flight. And they were looking ahead to days when we would fly hypersonically and high hypersonically and eventually even further. Uh, and looking to solve all the problems along the way that would allow that to happen wasn't something we talked a lot about because in those days space flight was not generally generally regarded as a realistic objective and uh, that was a bit pie in the sky so uh, although we were we were working toward that end uh, it was not something we acknowledged much publicly uh, not necessarily for fear, fear of ridicule but probably somewhat <laughs> With Sputnik and the whole, do you recall where you were or anything you heard about that? When you yeah. Realized? The Society of Experimental Test Pilots was holding a symposium in the Beverly Hilton Hotel in October of 57. And, uh, and I was working on, I, I think I may have been program chairman, but in it, I'm not sure about that now. But it, uh, for the symposium, but in any case, I was very much involved in the symposium, and we were trying to find ways to get the uh, the uh, Los Angeles press interested in the kinds of technical presentations that were being uh, being produced there, and and get a little coverage of, of what our industry was doing and what test what was happening in the test flight world, but that was a very hard sell and it became completely impossible when Sputnik uh, came across the sky and all of a sudden uh, we couldn't get any, any people to come listen to problems about airplane flying. Any of your own reaction to Sputnik? 
curiosity or more than that or God Almighty or what? Um, I don't remember exactly what my reactions were at the time, too much colored by intervening events. But uh, I guess it was disappointing that uh, that a country who was uh, uh, the evil empire in our minds at that, that time would be beating us in technology where we thought we were uh, preeminent. Uh, at the same time, it was, in, it was encouraging because uh, it demonstrated that the kinds of things that we were interested in really might be achievable and, and perhaps it would encourage people to look at our world with uh, somewhat more curiosity and perhaps approval than they, they had before. Uh, it did change our, our world. It, I mean, it absolutely changed uh, our country's uh, view of, uh, of uh, what, what was happening and the potential of, uh, of space. I'm not sure how many people realized at that point just where this would lead. And President Eisenhower, I think, was, was, was saying something like, well, what's, what's the worry? It's just one small ball. In, in the, but I'm sure he had a, a that was a, a facade you know, be, behind which he had substantial concerns because if, if they could put uh, something into orbit, they could put a uh, nuclear weapon on a target in the United States uh, because the navigation requirements were quite similar. Something you said a minute or two ago reminded me of all of the... Uh, how did the Russians get the bomb? And they must have stolen our secrets. They couldn't possibly have done this on their own. And they must have stolen our secrets. And they, they did in some part. But the real secret of the atomic bomb was revealed in August of 1945. That is, it works. And it seems to me that's almost what you're saying about Sputnik. I mean, it can, it it can be space. done. Yeah, it can be done. And uh, that was an eye-opener, I think, too. Yeah. To uh, a lot of people. And to Killian. Immediately, there was substantial interest in, uh, well, maybe we can get men, people up in, into space. Yeah. That, that was instantaneous, that, yeah. that possibility. You were, here you are a test pilot, and you're flying the most advanced aircraft in the world. What makes you, at that point in time, want to join the astronaut corps? What is it that they you want know, to decide, this is what I want to do? Oh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't an easy decision. Uh, I was flying the X-15 and, uh, and had, uh, I had the, uh, I had the understanding or belief that uh, if I continued I, I would uh, get the, be the chief pilot of that project. I was also working on the dinosaur, and that was uh, still a paper airplane, but it was a possibility. And then there was this uh, this other project done down at Houston, uh, the Apollo program. Gemini hadn't been really much identified at that at that point, and uh, wasn't clear to me which which of those paths had gone recognize that people who are in this world see projects come and go. They, this project established, begun, it may run for several years, finally get canceled, uh, and uh, I had been assigned to aircraft uh, test projects and never, never flew the airplane because uh, the need changed or something else became more important and uh, I never got to that that goal. And we sort of saw every 
every project of this type is something that, well, it may go or it may, may not. And uh, you, although you, you learn a lot when you're on a program that eventually gets canceled, you're, there's a lot more satisfaction in being on a program that really reaches its fruition. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you now just why, in the end, uh, I made the decision I did, and, but it, I, I consider it as fortuitous that I happened to pick one that uh, was a winning horse. But there would be no way to predict that at the time you made this, got to that fork in the road. And in my case, a three, three way fork. When the, um, some of the other test pilots that didn't go into the Apollo program at State Edwards that believed were flying our own yeah. planes and had that attitude, did you ever catch like space that's for, you know, like the dog that went monkeys. before the monkeys? Is that, like a, mm -hmm. is that kind of an attitude that prevailed? Uh, on, the, on the part of some, yeah. And at the time the Mercury program was started, it, it might well have gone that way. Uh, in a sense it did, in that they, they had uh, a lot of monkey flights and, and so on, chimp flights. But uh, I believe that the reason it, it did not keep that characterization was that the Mercury crewmen insisted on making it an airplane-like airplane, airplane -like device, fly like a, have the same conventions as normal airplanes so that your natural instincts were proper and insist that, uh, that the, the crewman be able to perceive enough and see enough and have sufficient uh, information available to him that he could make reasonable choices about proper alternatives and control the craft uh, in, a, in a manner that uh, would, would maximize the ability to get toward, toward the ob objective. Uh, so I think that was a great contribution on the part of the Mercury guys who, who were probably uh, um, abrasive uh, to s some of the engineering managers uh, in that time and in their uh, demands that the aircraft, that the craft to be built in, in this way. So that, that, that certainly was important. Did you have any encounters with Chuck Yeager during this period at all? Oh, I've known Chuck for, you know, 40 some years, yeah. Was he, I'm just curious about, was he somebody that other pilots looked up to as this extraordinary pilot? Or was he just another one of the guys? Oh, I think people, Recognize that he was a, a good, good pilot, good stick and rudder man. He's become almost a mythological pilot. I mean, his legend of Chuck Yeager's become. You think that's just through books and media and things like that? Yeah. Not past. <laughs> <laughs> the um, what was the astronaut selection process like, and what kinds of physical and psychological tests were you subjected to once you made that? decision Well, I don't think the, uh, the community of, of flight medicine and phys flight physiology knew very much what they needed to do at that point. Nobody, there were widespread predictions that, uh, that humans could not survive in space for a variety of reasons. Uh, both physical, physiological, and mental, and psychological, all kinds of reasons. Uh, so they didn't really know exactly what to test for, I think. So they did everything. They'd miss anything, as far as I know. <laughs> they did every test known to man. <laughs> Not necessarily fun. <laughs> Survivable. And you obviously passed all those with flying colors. I, I don't know what you the results were. The, um, what was your first experience and suddenly you're now on in the astronaut ranks? What became your impressions of the space task group and uh, how did that differ from being out in California? Well, a lot of the people in the space task group I'd known for some years because they were, mostly came from Langley, although some actually came from Edwards. 
some paper names, but predominantly Langley. And I had known them uh, in, the, in, in my work at, at Edwards because uh, they, they were very much involved in, in the analytical and the wind tunnel work that supported the kind of work that we, that we were doing. So uh, I, I, Bob Gilruth was a wonderful man who was a superb handling qualities expert. Uh, probably one of the best in the world. And, uh, and I knew Chris Kraft and Max Fugier and uh, remember the discussions earlier that we'd had at conferences on these subjects of uh, blunt shapes and flying bodies and winged vehicles and so on and which were the best configurations and what were the pluses and minuses of uh, different routes to uh, to go into space. So uh, I, I came in with the high confidence level that those were people who I could respect and knew uh, had had the background and the and the inclination and the determination to do what would lie ahead. How did your job you now as an astronaut differ from being a test pilot over the first thing you started realizing that would be different for you? Yeah, it was very different. There were some similarities in the sense that we were planning and we were trying to solve problems and devise approaches, but uh, since we were trying to do an operational job, uh, our, we were extremely focused. A, a, a research project tends to be more broad, generic, cover a range so that you have, uh, you have indications as to which might be the best path. In the, in the Apollo and Gemini programs, Mercury, I, was, I really wasn't involved in the early parts of that, but in the germination of Gemini and, and Apollo, we were looking for not a range of stuff, but the best method that we could find that would give us the ability to go at the earliest possible time, maximum speed, uh, and with the highest level of confidence. Quite, quite a different, quite a different uh, responsibility. Yet the the skills, the engineering approaches, and uh, and, the, and the equipment uh, available to us was really quite similar. I'm trying to picture or just things training and simulation, which are all part of getting ready for a successful space flight. How do you help determine what should be simulated and how? And in retrospect, how realistic were these training sessions and simulations from what you ended up encountering? Um, I, I think training was about one third of our time and effort. A third had to do with planning, figuring out a techniques and methods that would allow us to uh, a, achieve the trajectories and the, and the sequence of events and the ways of picking from the available strategies the one that might, might work the best. And the last part was testing, and that's probably equal to been a lot, you know, thousands of hours in the labs and in the spacecraft and running systems tests, all kinds of stuff, uh, seeing whether it would work and getting to know those systems very well. So the one third that was training is uh, training in a different sense than most people think of training because after all, uh, there wasn't anybody that had done this and that could tell us how to do it because no, nobody has had the experience. But they could tell us what they did know and some became systems experts and they would know the details of how the inertial guidance system or the computer or certain kind of engine valves and so on would operate and, and how we might handle malfunctions and those should they. And so, so we would we spend enormous amounts of time gleaning everything we could from these the people who are experts in these particular smaller 
uh, components of, of the spacecraft or the launch vehicle. Uh, we also spend a lot of time in simulations and uh, simulators have, have gotten better over the years at a prodigious rate. Uh, in my days at Edwards, we did a lot of uh, simulators, simulations of, of flight characteristics and, and aircraft trajectories and things of that sort. We did them all with analog computers because digital computers were just far too slow to, uh, to use for simulations. At about the time of the early 60s, uh, digital computers were getting faster and so and they were much more precise, slow but very precise. So then we started marrying analog and digital computers. And we used the digital to do the precise calculations and used the analog part to do the actual aircraft response things, which were, had to be a lot faster. And uh, then by the middle of the 60s, why computers were getting to be fast enough that you could actually do simulations of aircraft flight motions with them. So, uh, because I worked a lot in simulators as collateral duty uh, while I was here at Houston, uh, I spent a lot of time evaluating the authenticity and appropriateness of the simulation models that they were using. And you, know, you could usually find that the simulator didn't behave properly like it should in some regions of flight. So it was incumbent on us to uncover the, the, the problems that simulation have, try to make it as, as accurate as we could. Now there's uh, some uh, danger in that uh, because you might not be right uh, about your conclusions about uh, the appropriateness of the simulation. But it was an important part of our our function, and certainly the astronauts' crews weren't the only people doing that. Uh, test pilots at, at at Grumman and at North American and McDonnell, and also were doing similar kinds of things that contribute to that. And the result was uh, that by the time we in the late 60s, our our computer simulations were really quite excellent, they, and they were quite adequate to do most all the things that we were are doing. Uh, there's an old uh, uh, perception that simulators are always more difficult to fly than the craft themselves. And in general that that is true. And it's certainly turned out to be true in, in Apollo, uh, particularly the lunar module, and which was to our benefit that it was easier to fly than the, the simulator because uh, expecting something that was somewhat more cantankerous and contrary. Uh, than, than, it, than it actually turned out to be. Did you stay involved with operations and training even after you became a backup commander in January uh, 5? To a lesser extent because uh, once you get on a flight crew a very large percentage of your time is committed and uh, so at, at that point in time and before we had many new guys come in we had a bit of a gap in my in my perspective too many people were uh, they were gladly uh, assigned to flight crews but it left some openings uh, behind us and something weren't, weren't uh, covered uh, to the degree we would have liked them, them to have been how did you feel when President Kennedy made his great challenge to put a man on the moon to that speech not just yourself but the whole team you're with was that a moment where you really, I mean, can you recall Kennedy's speech and can you recall that kind of commitment that came out of President Kennedy? Um, well, uh, yes, I, I, I certainly remember it, but it's a bit hazy because I've heard the recordings of it so many times since that I, it, you don't remember, you don't, you're not certain whether you're remembering or you're remembering what you're remembering. Uh, uh, so I. I'm not certain uh, what it was, and of course it's been colored by the fact that I've read uh, so many stories of uh, how that that uh, 
process actually occurred and, and what led to his conclusion to, uh, to do that. And uh, I, I guess I've been persuaded by historians that, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been his first choice, but he didn't find any other good options to uh, go against the, the Soviets with. And the world was caught up in Let what me, the Soviets were doing, and he felt it. And, and, and he, he, he campaigned against uh, Lyndon uh, on the basis that we were behind in rocketry and, and, and Nixon. Uh, against and Nixon, Nixon, too, of course. Uh, so Against Eisenhower, really. Yeah, yeah, it was against the... Against the I guess I'm thinking of the youngness of all of you, and here's this young president saying that. Was it a kind of... He felt like he was part of the team, like he was a leader now with President Kennedy. We really had a leader that wanted to put the space program on the forefront of the American agenda. Um, our concern always was, uh, well, what will the Congress do? Uh, because, uh, you know, the President can proclaim, but it's the Congress that makes things happen. And so that's really where the question was, what, how are they going to, was it, as it turned out, they were, they were motivated to support the President in this, this area, which uh, I'm not sure I necessarily would have guessed at, at that point based on let me go back for a second <coughs> to the, the event that got the president to say we're going to get to the moon. Um, you were a combat pilot in the Korean War. That was only a decade earlier. And you were at, very, at the very cutting edge of test pilot and working on all the things that you were working on at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Did you guys pay much attention to that? Was there much feeling of, God Almighty, uh, we I, ought yeah, to be I in on this? Yeah, there was. There was, uh, because, uh, and, and you remember the time, it was a time of such incredibly high tension uh, nationally and, and internationally. And, it, you know, we were, I think everyone felt we were right on the, Brink uh, of potential World War III, and uh, I don't think anybody, even the people in the backwoods of Montana, were aware of of this 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 <coughs> heightened sense of tension. I was very aware of it, and I thought that that could uh, shove aside all the work we're doing in favor of other things that the country decided were more important from a strategic point of view. And what about you and the people you were working with? Did you feel like, God, what are we doing this for? Because we need to be a part of the, if there's going to be World War III, we want to be a part of it. And what we're aiming at right now, what we're trying to do is like yesterday's newspaper. Exactly. Uh, that, that was a concern, uh, but um, at the time, I think, you know, uh, the reality was you got your job to do and you just yeah. go ahead and do it and keep, keep doing it and hope, hope for the best. Yeah. Oh. As, as in the events of last Tuesday. Yeah. Just carry on. Yeah. Where were you when Alan Shepard made his famous flight? I don't know. I was at, at Edwards at the time, uh, but I can't remember uh, where specifically I was at the... Okay. And um, the same question with John Glenn, do you remember? Yeah, I was at home at the time, I remember. You're watching it on the television news yeah. and reading about it. And right. It was very early in the morning. I was in California, as I remember. I think it was dark. Mm -hmm. um, okay, do you recall when it was you were assigned to uh, the Gemini 5 mission? And what were your thoughts at that time? And how 
was training for a mission different, for that mission different than your general training? Like, how did your life change when you suddenly were assigned to the mission? Well, I was really uh, pleased to be assigned to a flight uh, and uh, quite satisfied to be in that position of, of, uh, uh, of backing up uh, Gordon Cooper. Uh, it was uh, a, quite a, a change uh, from the time before when we were working on lots of general projects and uh, trying to build pieces here and there to all of a sudden having a pretty much complete focus on achieving uh, the objectives of, of that flight, which was uh, originally intended to be uh, a one week long flight, the first long duration flight. And uh, there were a lot of other parts besides just long duration, but that was the principal objective. And uh, Elliot C. was my, uh, my associate on the, on the backup crew. Conrad was uh, flying the right seat in that, in that flight. We were a very close uh, team. We spent almost all our time together for months on end getting ready for that flight, both going back and forth between Houston and spent a lot of time at the plant in St. Louis uh, working with the spacecraft as it was nearing completion and p participating in the testing, testing of that that spacecraft. So we, we all knew it very well by the time uh, it was shipped to the Cape. When you say spent all, almost all our time, you ate, you ate your meals too? Yeah, we, yeah, we ate, ate together. And you, but not when we, when we were in, uh, in, in St. Louis. We certainly were at, at home. We'd, we'd get home sometimes, but the reality of, of the world in those days is that a lot of the testing took place at 2 o'clock in the morning or 4.30 in the morning and, and we were spelling each other off and, uh, and, and we would spend enormous amounts of time together working out the details. And this was single-minded. You weren't bullshitting about the latest play that you saw or oh, no, the latest no, novel you had no, no, I. I would, you know, I would not say that we never cracked a joke or, or uh, talked about something off the project, but you know, we were 98 percent focused on what the job we had to do, and I was, and my perception of my colleagues was the same. It, it is a part of the popular perception, I guess. And it appears in some of the literature that the other astronauts have put out that there was a lot of jockeying for position mm -hmm. and a lot of tension about who's going to get on this mission or that mission, who's going to be back, et cetera. Your reputation is the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear you speak about that. Well. Uh I was so pleased to be associated with the program because it was going, uh, it was happening, it was exciting. The, the goals I thought were important to not just the United States but to society in general and I would have been happy doing anything they told me to do. And uh, I, it's probably true that I was less uh, inclined to be concerned about just what job I had than, than some were. And I think they're all different people. They all had different kinds of uh, views and, and on, on that, that subject. Uh, it wasn't as obvious to me as some of the stories I've read uh, have portrayed it. Uh, I, I was, you know, I, I looked forward to an actual flight assignment to, as much as anyone, as opposed to be in the backup role. But the backup role, I thought, was an important job, and and uh, it just might turn out that we had to be ready, and we were going to be ready. And as you know, it, in some flights, it did turn out that the backup crews or members of them had to step in. Um, during the your the mission, how closely? Um, were you involved with evaluating various problems like fuel cell problems or 
the thruster or excess water production. Um, and what were your duties in assisting evaluation for, say, fuel cell problems? Did you have a specialty that you really, you know, knew more than some of the others? Or? Um, I was not a fuel cell expert. We did, we were at the, the uh, Cape, uh, Elliot C. And, and myself came back immediately after launch and actually talked to the to the uh, spacecraft when it over went overhead at the end of the first orbit from our T-38 uh, on VHF and uh, came back and landed immediately went to mission control and uh, made ourselves available to uh, to help with the flight so we were both involved throughout that entire flight uh, and I can't Certainly, you know, all the, the various problems that they bumped into on that flight were very much involved, but I can't recall any specific aspects of it. What were then the, the different requirements for the commander as opposed to uh, a pilot on these missions? What, what made the commander, what different responsibilities did the commander had? Well, we tried. Uh, to divide the res the responsibilities such that each crew crew person was about equally loaded. They had a uh, we we tried to for each person to be able to do know how to do everything uh, if they had to. But uh, we divided the responsibilities such that each would go into their area in enormous more amount more depth so they could uh, and that that worked pretty well I don't think it was practical or maybe even possible for, for both crewmen to know everything in the same degree of depth on every subject so uh, it was a shared responsibility uh, situation the commander uh, uh, I guess principally uh, differs because he has the responsibility for the decisions, just as the commander of a ship or commander of an airliner or anything. If necessary, the commander can override. Yeah, he's, a, he's always responsible for his craft. It was probably uh, a more concern as to when there were differences of opinion would be the differences of opinion between those in flight and those in mission control. Hmm. Uh, but I think we worked that out pretty well. We have great respect from those, the guys down there, uh, guys and gals in mission control. But I was going to ask you that the, the relations between mission controllers and the astronaut corps, you just characterized during this period, I guess you kind of did, it's pretty good. You felt that the respect for each of the other's jobs or something. Did where the tensions flare over disagreement? You know, hey, we're, you don't realize what we're dealing with, guys. Yeah, some sometimes it did. I, we were fortunate that on the flights I was involved in, uh, I don't think we had any problems of any significant magnitude in that category. Generally, uh, the people in in flight and the people in mission control were on the same frequency most of the time. There was not. A we and them. No, it's we and we. Um, yeah, can you describe a little bit your training um, for the um, Gemini Eight mission? And can you, or any of the nature, anything? You know, how was that different than some of your other training? Well, since. Uh, d uh, already been through one cycle with Gemini 5, I, I knew generally the content of, of uh, the preparation. Uh, the differences were those things that would be different between the flights. We were going to have a rendezvous, which Gemini 5 did not have. We we're going to have a, uh, a extra vehicular uh, backpack in the back. We had experiments that were different than the experiments on on Gemini 5. So we probably concentrated somewhat more on the things that were different. But we still did practice the rendezvous and practice the 
launches and practice the the uh, entry uh, steering and all those kinds of things. Uh, you had to sort of fill the squares and make sure you had done enough of those that you felt confident in your ability and the people that were, were watching you on, on the ground and kind of grading how you did also felt confident that you were in control of your destiny. How well did you know Dave Scott at the time? Uh, I had uh, had not known Dave uh, well at all uh, at Edwards, so I only got to uh, to know him when he came to Houston. Uh, but I liked working with Dave. He was uh, he was uh, very good at what he did. He was diligent and uh, and he was hardworking and. Uh, I felt confident in his uh, ability to handle his part of the responsibilities. And then the backup crews, Conrad and Gordon, I was wondering how, I'm still, I've never quite understood this, how did NASA decide who's going to be assigned which position on which mission? They would just, it wasn't for that particular mission, they felt one of you had a better skill, it was just to rotate you all and give you equal experience? Well. Uh, Dick Slayton was responsible for assigning uh, the crews, and uh, and I don't know what technique he used to do that. Uh, I he gave me the assignment of of determining uh, how many crews were needed. Uh, throughout the entire Gemini program, how many people were needed uh, <coughs> with assignments for uh, primary and, and uh, backup or alternate flight crews, and you know some people off and some people on vacation, some people sick, and and so I built uh, a schedule for him uh, of my perspective on what was required. And uh, and it's my belief that uh, that he used that kind of a uh, of a schematic to de determine when additional crews needed to be uh, brought into the program, and and uh, he used that kind of thing in this in the assignment because in assigning individuals to crews because uh, you couldn't you couldn't uh, just take one person. And decide where he's going to be without knowing what he would be doing next or before, and how that interfered with their uh, in, in, interconnected with other crew assignments. And it was a, quite a complex job, and we we actually had so few people that almost everybody was assigned all the time. For uh, I would in that period, I would come off one crew assignment, <coughs> and within a few weeks, I'd be assigned to something else, and that endured throughout the entire Gemini program. With the Gemini 8 mission, how concerned were you, were you with the success of the docking maneuvers and with, you know, considering it was really NASA's first attempt? We had a docking simulator which was quite quite accurate. We felt it was a good uh, representation of what we could expect and indeed it turned out to be uh, quite similar to what we in encountered in flight. Uh, I, I really believed that we we wouldn't have any trouble with the docking based on the simulations we did, and indeed that, that turned out to be the truth. What was going to your mind, however, when your, when your aircraft started to spin um, at that moment? I mean, was it was that one of the, you've had a lot of close calls from Korea to up to Edwards, was this, I guess, how do you maintain your pool under such uh, harrowing conditions? Um, we first suspected that uh, the Agena were, was the culprit. We had shut our own control system off, and uh, we were on the dark side of the Earth, so we really didn't have any outside reference or a very good reference. And uh, I didn't actually notice when it started to uh, started to deviate from the, the planned attitude. 
Dave first noticed noticed it. Neither of us uh, thought the Gemini might be the culprit because you could easily hear the Gemini thrusters where it, whenever they fired, they were out right in the nose, in front of it, some in the back. Every time one fired, it was just like a, a pop gun, crack, 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 and we weren't hearing anything, so uh, we didn't think it was our spacecraft. So Dave, who was running the Agena, he had the control panel for the Agena on his side, was a docking adapter and a electrical connection there that allowed Dave to send controls to the Agena control system. And so he was trying everything he knew without success. Uh, and uh, when the rates became quite violent, uh, I concluded that we just uh, we couldn't continue, that we had to, we had to get ourselves separate. I was afraid we might lose consciousness because our spin rate had gotten pretty high, high. and I wanted to make sure that we got away before, before that happened. And, of course, once we got away and found out we couldn't turn our thrusters back on and couldn't regain control in a normal manner, we recognized that it was failure in our craft, not, not the Agena. And the reason we didn't hear it is you don't hear it when it's running. Content, con you only hear it when it fires. You don't hear it when it's running steadily. Uh, I didn't really know that at the time. I figured it out. Hey, so is there were concern with colliding with the Gina after undocking? Sure, we were because we, uh, you know, we didn't uh, know exactly what our relative trajectories were would be, would be because uh, at the time we disengaged, we, we weren't in steady flight. If you're in steady flight, you can disengage and kind of predict what the relative paths will be, but uh, when you're tumbling, they, that's not predictable, so it was a bit dicey. It was a great disappointment to us uh, to have to cut that flight short. We had so many things we wanted to do, and some of them, I know Dave wanted to do an EVA and try out the backpack and do all that kind of stuff, and it just it was very disappointing to, to have to call it quits, come home. But you made a decision, and you got back to Earth. Yep. I spend a lot of my life talking to men who have made big decisions, and in this case, your life and others were at stake. And sometimes it could be a whole battalion, and sometimes a squad, or sometimes the crew of a ship, or whatever. What I get more often than anything else is, and, you know, how did you, what were you thinking, what, I mean, uh, how, how did you come to this conclusion, or, God, that was really gutsy of you to have done that, or so on, I'll say. Almost always, I'll say, that's where the training comes in, and you just follow your training. And this situation demanded that I do that. And I had learned that in training, and so I did it. Now, I'm not putting any words into your mouth, and I'm not putting those into your mouth, but in your case, it's certainly something you've thought about since. What do you attribute that decision and the action that you took to? Well, I can't make too much of it. I think generally you try to keep going as long as you safely can and try to save the, the flight, the objectives, and uh, try to put everything back together. And at some point you just have to make a decision that uh, I can't take the risk of uh, pursuing my goal further because uh, I have to I have to go back to the the uh, foundation instincts which is uh, uh, so save save your craft 
uh, save the folks, get back home, and uh, be disappointed that you uh, had to leave some of your goals behind. But the, mm -hmm. What was the reaction on mission control when you re-entered re you know, communications with them? And were they quickly able to adapt to the situation? Well, we didn't have uh, much con communication with mission control. You see uh, Murphy's Law says bad things always happen at the worst possible time. And uh, in this case, uh, we were in orbit that uh, did not go over stations that were in contact with, with uh, we didn't go over any station. We were sort of out of radio contact most of the time. And when we were, it was over the Rosenot Victor or the Coastal Century Quebec, the ships that were at sea who had limited ability to communicate back with uh, mission control and transmit data for uh, to them. So uh, our communication was just with the people uh, on those ships. And they were, uh, they were trying as best they could to, to be helpful and identify things, but uh, it, w it was a real challenge for them because uh, there wasn't much to be, <coughs> be gained. They could, they could see that we had a problem, but uh, as far as deciphering that problem, uh, they were, they, I think they were, in general, as much mystified as we were. When you started heading back towards Earth, did you start worrying about, you know, you're going to have to land in some remote location, you have to have a splashdown, or how are we going to be found? I would think I'd almost be more terrified with things splashing down into the, to the ocean and being unfound in a capsule there that might have a leak or something. And then when, I mean, we're all, or you just don't, you just keep trying to go forward. Uh, being an old Navy guy, I, I much prefer coming down in the water to coming down in Regina at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and they found you okay. But didn't, was there a lot of lag time between your rescue being picked up? We we heard uh, we heard the sound of the uh, of the propeller airplane. I think it was DC four uh, as we were coming down in the chute, and we assumed it was friendly. Mm -hmm. The um, I guess what I'm getting at is I'm just trying to put the normal. Order in the <coughs> possible to do, but in these moments, like on the next 15, when you're not sure you're going to be able to land, you know, I guess the skills of, of the astronauts is that ability to respond without panic in the most unbelievably, unbelievable situations imaginable. The thought that at any minute you might be unconscious in space, and that's happening, but at the same time you're seeing the spectacular scenery, I can't even imagine seeing Earth for the first time. Yeah. It, it, it seems to, it, what a, a rush of adrenaline and emotion, and yet with all that happening, it seems the, the, the astronauts, by and large, kept their, always did things, kept things in check. Is that a, a testimony to the training, or the, or the intelligence of NASA to find the right men who had, to use the cliche, the right stuff? Uh, I think it, predominantly it's experience over training. Uh, training certainly helps, uh, but uh, having uh, having uh, been in flying machines for many years and faced a lot of difficulty and become accustomed to being required to solve problems uh, as they arise uh, is, is, is expected of uh, pilots and particularly test pilots who get a higher percentage of things going wrong than, the, than, than normal pilots. I, I think that's, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we did it perfectly in, in every case, but uh, I'm sure we, we didn't. But uh, the experience that we'd had in flying a variety of different kind of machines in difficult circumstances uh, certainly uh, enhances your ability to uh, look at a situation and, and analyze it and determine what your probable best 
course is and how much latitude you have uh, to deviate from that best course. I, I, it's not a not an easy uh, subject to uh, to describe adequately, but uh, it seems to have worked. That's a quite wonderful answer, and it's gotten me to think. The men of World War II, with whom I was interviewed, almost none of them, and not even the regular army officers, nobody had ever been in anything like World War II before it came about. And they had to rely on their training. But you had experience. And you did as you just said. So, and if, you, if you're leading a squad forward into an attack on a terrain that is different from any other, there's no experience you can draw on in that. It's yeah. got to be training. Mm -hmm. But in your case, that's just quite a wonderful answer. And you also got me thinking of, you're afraid you're going to pass out and you're car reeling around in space and all the rest. It made me think about that guy last Tuesday on that plane that crashed that he sent down in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, and he, yeah. he just yeah. made this decision, screw this, I'm going to die anyway. Yeah. I think and that's now what I'm going to act on the, that basis. Yeah. It's, you know, there are a lot of scenarios you could point about, you could conjure about that, but one of them is right. I mean, yeah. uh, one of them, because there was, they did decide to uh, try to regain yeah. Yeah. control of the aircraft, and there was yeah. uh, some yeah. kind of a uh, battle between the people on board, and it didn't end up the way they wanted, but could have ended up worse, Those too. are real heroes. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it all this training in, uh, as exciting as it is to hear your career, there's a lot of sacrifice you're making constantly, you know, you're living in far from the desert in California and then Houston as it's just starting to really grow and work, you know, have difficult... Some people would think it's a sacrifice <laughs> to live in Houston. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm raising children, different hours... Just in August, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 I would think anything's worth it just to see Earth. I mean, you'd ever, just to see Earth from that perspective for a pilot that you got must have been something that yeah. so awesome. Yeah, it's a bit you could understand it. You can you can see these pictures and you can kind of get an idea. But you can take a picture of the Grand Canyon too and it's not the same as standing on the rim and looking down there. And I think it's the same same here. It's a picture does a great job, but it's not. It's not nearly like being there. Got a kid from Magic you know, just, and it was in part of your mind. Is uh, I guess at that moment was does that kind of calm come over you when you see Earth like that? I mean, is it almost a religious experience? Nah, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, it probably affects different people in different ways. Uh, it, it, it is spectacular, and uh, you know, I think everyone is touched by it when they when they have the experience. But I don't know what goes on in other people's minds. Okay. Um, let's when we move into uh, the early Apollo program. And, uh, the Apollo program started off with a tragedy. Uh, can you? share with us how the AS-204 Apollo 1 fire affected you personally, if you have any memories of that. Oh, yeah, I remember it uh, very well, and, and uh, I've known Gus for a long time. Ed White and I uh, bought some property together and split it. And I built my house on one half of it, and he built his house on, on the other. We were good friends, neighbors. Uh, yeah, those, those are very, very traumatic times. Uh, and, you know, uh, I suppose uh, you're li much more likely to accept uh, loss of, of, of a friend uh, in flight, but it really hurt to lose him in a ground test. I mean, that was, 
you know, it was an indictment of ourselves. I mean, they, we did it because we didn't, we didn't do the right thing somehow. And that's doubly, doubly traumatic. Were you involved in the investigation of what occurred? Did you start looking into uh, it? No, I was not, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Frank Borman. Uh, what was involved in the leadership of that uh, that investigation? There's some people that say that that tragedy, in many ways, started helping get a better sense of focus and discipline um, with NASA on exactly what it would take to make a lunar landing. Did you find a change of uh, more of a, some of the uh, around NASA in general of the more seriousness of intent, and more triple checking of everything before of taking nothing for granted? Partly that, uh, secondarily, and perhaps even more importantly, we were given a gift of time. We didn't want that gift, but we were given months and months to uh, not only fix the spacecraft, but rethink all our previous decisions, plans, and strategies, and change a lot of, of things, and hopefully for the better. So. Uh, the same thing happened after the Challenger explosion. We got time and they fixed a lot of things that needed to be fixed and they never had time to do it before. So we, we get a, an added benefit, but uh, we regret the price we had to pay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let me interrupt for this second. Test pilots are losing friends often. I, and, and you must have lost some friends. Many, many. Yes. But you hit me hard with that. This was on the ground. Yeah. That's not the way you want it to happen. I'm sorry. Not that it's any less knowable. Yeah. Because it is. <laughs> no, but of course not. It just yeah. hurts. Yeah. Just wondering how these now the Apollo missions um, started were different from um, the previous ones, the training for them. Now that you're in the Apollo program, especially since the possibility was that you're training for the moon, how did the training change? Um, it was the same in that it was very goal oriented and very. Uh, and we tried to define it as narrowly as we can uh, uh, rather than as broadly as you would in, in research because with, with the time constraints that we were facing and the desire to get there as fast as we can, we were, we were in a race and that was, uh, that was very evident to us all the time. We wanted to uh, not uh, be diverting your attention in any way for with, to things that you really did not need to worry about. You want to focus on all the things that you knew you had to do and had to master. Well, that, uh, that was the principal uh, difference uh, as we went into the Apollo flights. Yeah, how, well, first off, on the Apollo 1 on the tragedy, do you remember where you were when you I was in Washington. There was a, there was a uh, president was signing uh, the treaty with uh, other na nations that kept the moon uh, as the property of all people. It was a non. Uh, non-staking a claim <laughs> treaty. So you were there at the White, at a White yeah, House? Yeah, I was at the White House. I think it was at the White House. I believe it was. Uh, the ceremony, and then suddenly the news came through to everybody there or on your way out? Do you um, was that? I, it was, I don't, I, I think it, it was after this, the 
ceremony, to, but I don't remember exactly how we. And you were with a group of people from yeah. sitting there, so that yeah. come up to be part of the ceremony, and then you yeah. got that the news, and then you came back to Houston after you got the news, or um, probably the next day. Next yeah, day. I, that's a bit hazy. No, no, that's helpful to just put you in place. I think um, the. Um, I mean, how did you react when you first learned of NASA's decision to send what was then Apollo 8 to the moon? Do you recall, I mean, that the, the, the feelings of you know, which one of these was going to go to the moon, so they're talking about sending Apollo 8 to the moon? We were very excited about it. We, we thought it was uh, very bold because they, we hadn't we still had the Progo problem on Saturn, and we'd had a couple of problems with the with the few Saturn V launches. So to take the take the next one, and without those problems being demonstrated as solved, and put men, a crew on it, and not just take it into the orbit to take it to the moon, it seemed uh, incredibly uh, aggressive. But we were for it. I mean, we thought that was a wonderful. Opportunity, and uh, if if we could if we could make it work, why it would give us a giant uh, jump ahead. You remember it was kind of complex. We got this. We had to sp switch crews around and switch some spacecraft and change the order completely. And it was a, a kind of a complex process, but it showed uh, showed a lot of. The courage uh, on the part of uh, NASA management to uh, make that step. What was the impetus for that decision to speed it up to that degree? Well, the lunar module was falling behind; wasn't ready to fly, and they were saying, "What can we, what can we do? We've, we've had, we've been in Earth orbit. What can we do without a lunar module?" And I don't know which minds first came up with the idea of, well. Why don't we think about a circumlunar flight with it? Uh, leave the lunar module behind. What were the what immediate new concerns would somebody like yourself have? Let's just say that you're a pilot, you know, a, a top flight pilot would have about leaving Earth's gravitational, you know, immediate gravitational influence. What what would frighten a pilot about that? Well, I, I suppose uh, that everyone would have concerns, but I don't know that they'd all be the same. Uh, people would worry about different things. Uh, I, I remember uh, that uh, one of the things that, that I was concerned with at the time was whether our navigation was sufficiently accurate uh, uh, that we could, in fact, devise a trajectory that would get us around the moon at the right distance without, let's say, hitting the moon on the backside or something like that. And if we lost communication uh, with Earth for whatever reason, uh, could, we, uh, could we navigate by ourselves using celestial navigation? Uh, you know, we thought we could, but these were undemonstrated skills. <laughs> well, you got me thinking about it. you didn't have a very big window to look out of to do celestial navigation. No, we we did have a uh, we're probably the only yes, it's probably the only organization in in history that's been sold a one power telescope. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what we used for uh, doing the sextant shots and doing the star star. Well, what were your thoughts when you were finally, ch and, and where were you? I'm sorry, Tim, I try to put things in locations of it personally, but what were your thoughts and, and where were you really when you were chosen for the lunar landing mission for Apollo 11 when you first got the word? It was uh, during the flight of Apollo 8. Uh, oh, while it was up there. Yeah, uh, and during the flight of Apollo 8, I had three or four meetings with uh, Deke Slayton about first, would I take the third one down and 
then we had a lot of talks about who might be available and be right to be on that crew and that sort of thing. So you participated in a discussion of who? Yeah. It was his decision, but he it's wanted your input. Absolutely. And I think we're in Collins and Aldrin were two of the people you thought would be. Yeah, we had we didn't have very many choices, but we had several other people that we could make available, uh, and so we <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking about that. And, um, how well wait, wait, and and what characteristics mattered? Level-headedness, quick-wittedness, eye-hand coordination, experience, uh, general knowledge, experience, experience and uh, what things uh, people were uh, particularly skilled at, uh, had uh, some knowledge or flight experience related to that those those jobs and so on and uh, and uh, there were other considerations like if, if we switch things around too much why well, you're going to get other people's nose out of joint because they stole somebody from somebody else's crew I mean there were a lot of you know typical kinds of things that you would personality uh, sure we talked about those things yeah. talk about everything that you might expect you must have been quite touched that he slightly asked you at that point. <coughs> that was, must have made your, my goodness, this is happening now, the excitement, the reality that this could be the big moment. Of well, it was going to be a big moment no, no matter what the, what the flight objective was, but there wasn't any way we'd know what it was going to be at that, at that point in time. Because right. the lunar module had not flown, uh, hadn't even been in Earth orbit. Uh, we didn't know if we could communicate with two vehicles simultaneously at lunar lunar distance. We didn't know whether the radar ranging would work. A lot of things we just didn't know at that point. And, uh, it would have been, I think at that point in time I uh, did not really expect that uh, we'd get the chance to, to try a lunar landing on, on that flight. There's too many things could go wrong on, on 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever. The, how, what was your relationship? Did you know Collins and, and Aldrin fairly well before this assignment? Uh, I'd never uh, worked on a crew with them, uh, but uh, uh, to, part of the time uh, I had in the early days of Apollo 8, Michael was first on that flight. Uh, so, uh, and I did not, uh, not work with Buzz. Uh, so, uh, but I'd, I'd known them uh, pretty well because in total we were still a pretty small group. We knew some of the people a lot better than others because we worked with them a lot and spent a lot more hours in the middle of the night testing spacecraft, but you get to know each other very well in <laughs> these periods. Who ended up picking the names of Eagle and Columbia for your spacecraft and, and, and um, what the symbolism do you feel? The crew, we, as a crew, uh, did uh, did that. I, you know, we we all participated. I I think uh, Mike probably was as uh, convincing as, as as anyone, and as as we deliberated. And, but we'd was it been, one of your fun recreational things, like making a list of what we should call them, kind of a little we, bit? We, have lots, we had lots of those little things which we considered to be non-operational decisions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which they were kind of a pain to have to deal with all those, because, have, <laughs> but we had to do it. A name beyond, beside, that you prefer to the Eagle and the Columbia that you can No, I, I, thought, uh, I, I thought we came out with the right ones. While we're on these naming, and these are famous names, of course. It was Winston Churchill who picked Overlord. Was it? Yeah. And then how did they get Sword, Juno, Gold, Utah, yeah. and Omaha, Omaha Beach? Beach. Yeah. They drew them out of the hat. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. The, um, 
Well, once the decision had been made that Apollo 11 would be the first one to attempt the lunar landing, how much uh, emphasis did the mission planners and manager place on public relation issues? How much of your time is consumed with how are we going to market this to the American public, both for you know for all the reasons that you? I didn't. I didn't think there was very much uh, of that. <coughs> there were. There were. There were. Some things that were done specifically for the benefit of giving the press the opportunity to uh, either talk with us or take pictures of our our activities and in, in uh, preparation, and there were other normal things that we were doing where some access was granted, uh, and we probably resented that to some ex extent. But at the same time, we recognized that uh, it was not an unreasonable requirement, and, and we were uh, certainly willing to uh, accommodate those uh, those requirements. Uh, Did you find the intense media focus um, disrupting a disruptive force in any way, or that for your concentration or training? Well. It, it might have been a burden if we'd had time to notice it, <laughs> but we were so going uh, full blast, trying to be ready on time, and we just uh, tried to shut anything out of our mind that didn't wasn't focused on our principal objective. Um, if you would describe your training with the lunar landing research vehicle and the lunar landing training vehicle, what was it like to try to fly it? And how uh, valuable was that experience during your mission? Start at the end and work back. It turned out to be very uh, valuable. Originally, when uh, they started first talking about uh, lunar landing and uh, wasn't known what technique would be used to go there. Uh, I was at Edwards, and uh, we started thinking about how you would simulate flying over the moon. And that was a natural thing for us because in-flight simulations was our thing out at Edwards. That's we did lots of in-flight simulations, tried to duplicate other vehicles or or uh, duplicate trajectories, or duplicate this, or duplicate that, make something fly like something else. It was just what we did. Um, Don Bellman and Gene Matranga, two, two engineers, uh, and, 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 and myself, to some extent, started talking about how you might do this. And uh, our first idea was to, to um, for, for if we ever needed for training, was to have the spacecraft. And we didn't know what the spacecraft would look like. Have the spacecraft carried on another vehicle and make that other vehicle be something that would create the conditions that would duplicate the lunar gravity and lunar vacuum and so on. Uh, then w our thought was, uh, when the vehicle gets built, we can put it on top of this carrier, and they can actually fly it just like they would over the moon, and they could do it at Edwards or, or wherever, get, and learn how it flies. Then we decided that was going to be a pretty complicated project, and what we should do before we did that was build a little device, a little one-man uh, <coughs> device which would just invest, investigate the qualities and requirements of flying in the lunar, uh, to build the database from which we would build the bigger thing to carry the real spacecraft. So uh, we actually devised a, uh, such a craft. It looked like a, a tin can, Campbell soup can sitting on top of some legs with a gimbal engine underneath it. and. Uh, and that uh, became the basis for what uh, 
went out as a requirement for a bid to build the LLRV, Lunar Landing Research Vehicle. It was not known at this time that there would be a lunar module. It was a direct ascent and earth orbiting uh, rendezvous and other strategies were still being considered. Matter of fact, uh, the, the uh, lunar, mo lunar module came after the lunar landing research vehicle. Fortunately, the characteristics and the size and the inertias and so on of this training device were very much like the lunar module. And that was strictly fortuitous. <laughs> uh, and so it, it turned out that the people, that it, this is after I had left there, Joe Walker, Don Malik and so on, went, went through the project of flying this thing and finding out what the characteristics of a machine flying in a lunar environment would be. And subsequent to that, or, or at that time, the, the, it was decided to go the lunar orbital rendezvous method and build a lunar module. And uh, it turned out that was just about the right size. Yeah. Uh, after that, they made the lunar landing training vehicle, which was designed to be even more limb-like. So that would give you good, uh, a good uh, representation. And in fact, it did. And I, all the pilots, I think, to my knowledge, everyone thought it was an extremely important part of the preparation for the lunar landing attempt. And it, as you know, that you may know, the lunar landing, the lunar module was uh, designed to be able to make an automatic landing. But uh, to my knowledge, no one ever did. So the simulation, how, how close a simulation was this training to the actual landing? I mean, did you feel it was almost that? Were you in for any surprises when you actually had to actually land it differently than with your simulation? It was it was harder to fly than the lunar module, more complicated, and subject to uh, the problems that wind and gusts and turbulence and so on introduce that you don't have on the moon, and uh, the systems were somewhat uh, choppier or. or uh, less smooth than the actual lunar module. Uh, both propulsion and attitude control systems were, so the lunar module was was a pleasant surprise. What was, you might discuss the incident you had with the lunar landing research vehicle when it crashed, and what was your involvement in the investigation and recovery process in that? Did they be part of all of that? Uh, well, is fairly well covered in a variety of documents. Uh, just say that uh, for un unknown reason, the pressure and gas. Uh, I, I was I was conducting a simulated lunar approach and lost the pressure and gas to the attitude control rockets. And uh, when the when you lose attitude control, why uh, it slowly just emerges. Not very slowly. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, there was very little time to analyze alternatives at that point. It was just because I was so close to the ground, below 100 feet in altitude. So it was just, uh, again, time when you make a quick decision, you, and you departed. I did not uh, participate in the uh, investigation of that because I was other, I had otherwise uh, assigned duties at the time, so others did that. So we lost three of those vehicles, uh, and, and uh, it was a contrary machine and a, a, and a risky machine, but a very useful one. How did your training for Apollo 11 differ from the training say, for Apollo 8? And I mean, just briefly, if you could, just what did your training <coughs> consist of? Um, well, on the, on the training uh, part of our activities, the uh, addition was the lunar module, which we had not uh, had on Apollo 8. So, uh, well, Michael Collins spent uh, 
all of his time uh, mastering the command module. Uh, Buzz Aldrin and myself uh, fo focused a great deal of our time on on um, on mastering the lunar module, knowing it uh, inside out, and uh, and then we had, of course, to learn the experiments and the the uh, lunar surface uh, science work and uh, the the uh, installation of equipment on the moon and all that kind of stuff, which took a lot of time, uh, and. Uh, I suppose uh, we would have liked a little more time, but uh, when the time came, we had to say, yeah, we were ready to go. Were there any specific incidences during the training for Apollo 11 that made a significant impact on you or your crew members or your mission, something that occurred during the training that when you were in space and heading to the moon really was of extraordinarily beneficial nature? I know there are many things that were, I just wonder if something Oh, yeah. There were a lot of, a lot of complexities. Uh, we were most concerned with mastering the times, uh, like when we separated the vehicles, and making certain that the computer knew what the velocities and directions of each vehicle were before and after that separation. It's a, it's a very difficult, complex procedure to make sure the computer isn't fooled somehow or loses information in that process. And then uh, the navigation system was dependent on the alignment of the inertial unit. And we were very, and that any time, once you turn that loose, it drifts at a very, slow rate, so we wanted to be sure that it didn't drift outside uh, limits and find procedures that we could use to confirm that we would still have adequate, uh, ad adequate quality navigation information to complete the lunar landing. That re uh, that's, uh, I'm afraid it's a c complex subject that's not easily uh, described. But uh, uh, from the time we last aligned the platform until landing was some, some substantial number of hours, and so we wanted shortly before landing to confirm that that uh, that dr platform hadn't drifted off too far. That was our attitude reference. So we took a sun sunshot had had the computer point us at the sun, our telescope at the sun, and make sure. Uh, that it it uh, cut the sun just exactly uh, through the middle. If it didn't, why the error would be due to uh, the alignment of the our net of our nav the drift of our navigation system. A lot of little things like that, which were uh, extremely important and and uh, painfully tedious, but absolutely necessary. How did you cope as the as the flight day got closer and closer with the just overwhelming interest that developed for the Apollo flight and the first man on the moon and the uh, you know crowds of people everywhere in the whole world watching? Here you are, the you know young man who was like planes from Ohio that's kind of moved through all these programs. How did you, you were, how do you numb out all of those external forces that are happening all around you? Just yeah. experience and she had taught you I don't I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, we we tried to uh, provide some information uh, that would allow uh, that public exposure to the kinds of things we were doing. And uh, beyond that, uh, when those things were done, we just uh, turned back inwards to our own problems, our own schedules, our other our own list of things that we had to get done, and. Uh, get a confidence uh, level that we were, were ready to go. So we just sort of shut that out that uh, all the time that that was outside those spaces that we spe specifically allocated to the, the, the public uh, exposure. 
To follow up on Doug's question, this, I, I don't know if it was the most anticipated event of the 20th century. There, there, there have been a lot of events in the 20th century, and, and many of them have changed the world and so on. Um, but it, nobody knew that Hitler was going to invade Poland. Hitler and his general staff knew it, but nobody else in the rest of the world knew it. Nobody knew about Pearl Harbor except Young Moto and a few pilots. Um, nobody knew about last Tuesday except a small handful of people. This had to have been just about the most anticipated event, maybe even ever. Hmm. I was trying, a heavyweight boxing champion going into Muhammad Ali versus Frazier. There's a lot of pressure on those guys and a lot of build up and they've got to learn to do exactly as you just said. You just got to freeze it out and you've got to, and you, you look at their eyes when these heavyweight boxers come in for, and their concentration is total. Mm -hmm. But you went through the most anticipated, because it was so anticipated, the most. And yet what you said, reminded me of Muhammad Ali. But this wasn't a sporting event or anything else, but I don't know what the hell else you do, except you just try to screen it all out and concentrate on what, and I'm trying to put words in your mouth, and I don't mean to do that. But. Well, I think you're right. We, we were, we tried to be as focused as we could, work on the things we could do something about, and not worry about the things that were beyond our ability to change. Did you, if you can really capture yourself back to the, as the day the clock's ticking for takeoff, would you every night or most nights just go out quietly and just look at the moon? I mean, so if you came something like, my goodness. No, we no, never did that. Never did anything like that, really? No. <laughs> we, we'd, you know, we'd look at the books or we'd look at, talk about strategies or what are we going to do if this happens or are you sure you know how to handle this uh, and that's where we spend our time. A lot of what if talk. Yeah, yeah, that's our business. Yeah. And you know, normally you get, get a lot of unexpected things happen and usually they're not the ones you practice. But the fact that you practiced a lot of different things put you in the proper mindset to handle whatever it is that comes along even as if it isn't the one that you've experienced before and i think that happened on a lot of the flights yeah did you develop a relationship of studying the moon as a as a you know the maps of the moon as as they were at the time and like learning everything you could about its makeup and i mean part of your reading if you're not just looking at the moon but really kind of become an expert on the moon or was it that important? Well, important? you know, we'd, we'd been doing that part of it now for three or four years, working on the, this background information. Uh, in, the, uh, in the last months before flight, we didn't do much of that except to look specifically at our landing areas and landmarks and <coughs> things that we would actually be using or re to which we would be referring during the progress of the flight. So those things we, we looked at, but the, the broader picture we, we didn't spend much time on. I think it, it, we're almost ready to blast off. Maybe we ought to take another break before we blast off. Okay. You think? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I was curious. If you had any geologic, I guess I was getting to this on the question about the moon itself, but I mean, did, was, did NASA require geological training for the Apollo 11 mission or to, so you could notice things that you might see or was... Yeah, we spent a lot of time in, in geology training predominantly before we were, had a uh, flight assignment, not exclusively before, but predominantly before. Thank you. Uh, had very fine uh, group of instructors very knowledgeable about the subject uh, uh, of astrogeology or selenology or the various 
things that might most be applicable to what we uh, might encounter on the lunar surface. Um, some uh, had the opportunity to and, and the interest to become very good geologists. I never put myself in that category. I enjoyed geology and, uh, and it was certainly appropriate to uh, understanding what we were seeing uh, on the surface of the moon, but <coughs> our time was, was quite limited there and we had a lot of things to do and uh, had, I, had I been a better geologist I might have seen some things that were important that I, that I missed. Uh, and if that were true, I, I regret it, but uh, at the time we had available, I, I think uh, everyone did a pretty credible job of being able to, uh, to see things that were important and uh, know which samples to pick up and, and be able to describe to people back on, on Earth what they were seeing. Uh, certainly the knowledge of the lunar surfaces increased immensely as, uh, as a consequence of, of those observations and those sam samples and as, of course as you know that that work continues yet today in labs around the world. Or did, was there a debate whether you would find water on the moon? Was that something that you was... There was, there was not an expectation that, uh, that we would um, and uh, I, I don't remember what our our, our uh, thinking might have been in looking for things that might might uh, might disclose the possibility of either past or or hidden water. I, I just don't remember that very well. Let me ask a layman's question on this. Now I understand there is some feeling in NASA that there may be water on the moon. The question is, how could there be water without clouds? If there's water, there's going to be clouds, uh, it seems to me. If it's, uh, the thinking is if it's in perpetual darkness, uh, at what that is in a crater, polar crater, or a low spot so that it never sees the sun, uh, sublimation rates will be extremely low, and uh, and there way, well might be uh, mm -hmm. bodies of water there, and there's some spectral uh, data that indicates there way well that that may be true, mm -hmm. but it's not yet proven to my knowledge. The, um, was there anything about the Takeoff of Apollo 11 launch that was different than from the feeling that I'm talking about just the immediate seconds after a launch that was different than other missions you were on. Yes, it was um, one. Well, a couple of things. One is uh, the acceleration is at a very low G level. Spark uh, starts at. Well, I don't know, I think less than half a G. I've forgotten exactly, but it's, but it appears to be quite rapid. It's, uh, but it would uh, be, be less than, substantially less than the acceleration of a rock that you dropped. So it's kind of a slow ascent. The thing that surprised me, and we knew this ahead of time, that attitude control uh, in space uh, to pitch the the craft, you use a, say, say you wanted to pitch up, you would use a down-pointing rocket in the front and an up-pointing rocket in the back. And that would, that would pitch the craft up. But we didn't want any rockets firing up when we were accelerating away from the moon because that would be wasting fuels. So we would only use the down-pointing rockets because they would be adding to our velocity and it would be fuel efficient. But the result of that is that there's a substantial rocking motion as you pitch forward, the, the 
the uh, pitch up thruster fires, lifts your nose up, then it stops, then the nose falls down again, and the rocket fires, and so you're in a rocking chair. Now we knew this, but the simulators never included this in their in their representation of the motions. Uh, and so consequently, it's quite an unusual, uh, I, I thought quite an unusual motion. And, uh, and I, perhaps I should have expected it, but we'd never seen it in, in our preparation. How serious a concern was there about contamination on your return to the Earth? Was that something you, not just with NASA, but yourself, did you know, reserve? How serious was that concern? Oh, uh, I don't know that that I can say, uh, as you know, that uh, I think it was the National Academy of Science was given the task of evaluating the potential danger from uh, lunar contaminants uh, on, on the Earth, and it was <coughs> they who I think said the, the, uh, <coughs> the chances are extremely unlikely, and they gave a statistic, which I won't attempt to quote because I'm sure I'd have it wrong at this point. Uh, nevertheless, they decided to go ahead and and have uh, have a decontamination faci facility and put us in quarantine for for a period of time equal to the expected incubation time of any disease that could provide it an epidemic. Twenty one days from the time we left the surface of the moon till they left us out. Uh, as you know, they used samples of the soil and and uh, and put it in soil that plants were growing in and exposed it to animals and various kinds of things to see if there were any reaction whatsoever. Uh, I don't know to what extent they found anything, but certainly if they if they found anything, it wasn't serious. And uh, after a um, couple of of flights with the uh, that quarantine, they discontinued that protection system. During the actual landing on the moon, when the program alarms sounded, um, what, what was your re reaction? How did you respond? Um, you're always concerned when any kind of alarm comes on, but uh, it wasn't a, a, a serious concern because uh, there wasn't anything obviously wrong. The vehicle was flying well. It was going down the trajectory we expected. You no know, abnormalities in anything that we saw other than the computer said there's a problem and it's not my fault. Uh, and the people here on the ground were, were right on top of that. And, uh, and of course, the, the computer continued in a contrary manner there periodically all the way to the surface. But uh, my own feeling was that as long as everything was going well and looked right, uh, the engine was operating right ahead control and we weren't getting into any unusual attitudes or things that looked like they were out of place, uh, I would be in favor of continuing no matter what the computer was complaining about. To the, the, it's much as you, you're talking about your experience and duty and, and propelling this mission forward, there's a real chance of death and failure here, and not just failure for your, and death for yourself and failure for the United States, the whole world watching this kind of mission. Yeah. Have, did, you, um, did you read that lately they released the Nixon had William Sapphire, right? The, a death letter about what would happen if you, the three astronauts died on this mission. Did, did you have a chance to see that document? I have heard that, but I, I have not seen it. The, um, is that, you just have to numb yourself from that kind of concern of the grandness of all of this? That are you, is this, what, I guess what I'm saying is Apollo 11, due to the, as Steve said, what perhaps the most watched event in the history of, of, of certainly the century of the world, how does, you didn't treat it differently mentally at all as you would something, uh, uh, one of your previous missions? Um, we are certainly aware that uh, it was, this was uh, the culmination of uh, the work of three, four hundred thousand people over a decade and uh, that the nation's hopes and 
outward appearance largely rested on how the results came out. Uh, with those pressures, it seemed the most important thing to do was focus on our job as best we were able to and tried to allow nothing to distract us from, uh, from doing the very best job we, we could. And, uh, you know, I have no complaints about the way uh, my colleagues were able to step up to that. Let me interject here that you share a quality with General Eisenhower. When the reporters would come to him during the war and I want to get a story, he always said, go talk to Bradley. Go talk to Patton. Go talk to a sergeant. That's where the real story is. This is a team effort. And I, he would never allow it to concentrate on him. It was inevitable that it was going to happen, but that was his. And, and then after VE Day, the, the, the Churchill arranged a big event in, in London that Eisenhower went to to be awarded the key, I think the keys of the city, but it, it, you're now a citizen of London. Mm -hmm. And all this concentration on Eisenhower. And in his speech, he talked about the closeness between Abilene and London, which was a nice touch. The way we all believe in freedom and we're going to fight for it and so on. But he also said, if I'd have had the wisdom of Solomon, if I'd have had the character of Lincoln, I never could have done any of this by myself. This is a team effort. And you just spoke about the hundreds of thousands of people that have been working for so long to make this happen. And I, I, I invite you to make a reflection on the team nature of the Apollo 11 mission. Well, Each of the components of our hardware were designed uh, to certain reliability specifications. And far the majority, as to my recollection, uh, had a reliability uh, requirement of 0.99996, which means that you have four failures in 10,000 operations. And uh, if I've been told that if, if every uh, component met its reliability specifications precisely, that a typical Apollo flight would have about 1,500 separate identifiable failures. In fact, we had more like 150 failures per flight. Uh, ten times better than statistical methods would tell you you, you might have. And I can only attribute that to the fact that every guy in the project, every guy on the bench building something, every assembler, every inspector, every guy that's setting up the test, cranking the torque wrench and so on, is saying, man or woman, if anything goes wrong here, it's not going to be my fault because my part is going to be better than I have to make it. And when you have hundreds of thousand people all doing their job a little better than they have to, you get an improvement in performance. And that's the only reason we could have pulled this whole thing off. Let me invite you to also make an observation, if you wish. It is a part of the popular culture that any time the government gets involved in a project, they're going to screw it up. 
talking to more this morning, I was thinking about some of the great events of this century, and, 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 or the 19th, or the 20th century, or the 19th century. The atomic bomb, the Lewis and Clark expedition, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, Dr. Salk. It's almost always the government that gets behind this. And you certainly, on Apollo 11, were at the very cutting edge of an enormous spear that was built by the government. And I would just wonder what comments you might or might not have on that. When, when I was working here at the Johnson Space Center, then Manned Spacecraft Center, uh, you could stand across the street and you could not tell when quitting time was. Because people didn't leave at quitting time in those days. People just worked. And they worked until whatever their job was done, and if they had to be there till 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 9.30, whatever it was, they were just there. They did it. And then they went home. So 4 o'clock or 4.30, whenever the bell rings, you didn't see anybody leaving. Everybody was still working. Uh, and the way, the way that happens and, and the way that may be <coughs> different from other sectors of the government uh, to which some people are, are sometimes properly critical is that this was a project in which everybody involved was one, interested, two, dedicated, and three, fascinated by the job they were doing. And whenever you have those ingredients, whether it be government or private industry or our retail store, you're going to win. One of the, um, I guess probably the question you must get tired of the most is the most famous words of the 20th century, you know, that's one small step for man, one time leap for mankind, and maybe you've answered this question so many times before, but it's you find it curious that NASA didn't script a line for you to say that they allowed you the kind of personal freedom to uh, to you know, I almost if I put myself in that situation I would have almost wanted to say Neil here's the line we'd like you to say when you get to the movie they gave you that well in retrospect they might have wished that <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the late Julian Chair uh, who uh, really led the NASA relations with the outside world in, in many ways uh, was ad absolutely adamant that uh, headquarters never put words in the mouth of their, their people, not just astronauts, but anybody, that they let people speak for themselves. They, they made it known sort of what the party line was and uh, what the NASA position was, but beyond that, they never, uh, in my, in my, to my knowledge, uh, controlled the, the, uh, the statements, public statements of others, and certainly they insisted in, in the case of the flight crews that uh, they not be told what to say, and the, that their the statements the crew be their their own uh, elocution of what they saw and what they wanted to say. And uh, as far as I know, that that prohibition was never violated. And with you actually crafting that line, that was just something you were thinking about as the moment approached when you knew this was going to happen. You thought <coughs> about in your head, or be the, did you think maybe I should just say, man is now on the moon? Or did you realize, I think it's a, that's a magnificent line. Uh, I think most people do. Everybody I really think does. I mean, but did, how did that come about? Just your, where you had some time while you were getting prepared for the, you know, to leave the eagle, that you knew that that would be the proper line or line you wanted to say? Yeah, I thought about it after, after landing. Uh, 
and because we had a lot of other things to do, it was not something that I really concentrated on, but just something that was kind of passing around subliminally or in the background. As, but it, you know, was a pretty simple statement. And talking about stepping off something, why it wasn't a very complex thing, uh, and uh, it was what it was. <laughs> But as Doug said, everybody in the world knows the line, and everybody in the world are so grateful that you didn't say, that's one giant leap forward for the United States. <laughs> <laughs> now the, um, I mean, it's, and you get, I guess now you must realize, I mean, how often that news clip of you descending Mm -hmm. the image, when you see that now, this many years later, that image, does it still affect you in any way? Like, wow, that's me back then? No, you know? no, no. And, so, and the, um, when you said, that when you crafted the line and you were coming down, were you, I mean, how much of a concern is that? I mean, is it, were, you had a lot of things running, also you're hoping just to get that footprint put on the moon. I guess... I, I didn't think of it as being as important as, uh, as others uh, didn't want to be dumb, but I, uh, you know, I, I contrived in a way, and and uh, and I, I was guilty of that. <laughs> the um, when you were on the moon, there are not that many photographs of you on the moon. Um, they seem to be much more of those older, and that's because you were. Taking more of the photographs? He's a lot more photogenic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had the job of, of, of taking, taking a lot of the pictures. That was uh, part of my assigned responsibility. So, you know, And uh, each of us had, a, there was a, a short time in the middle where uh, I transferred the camera to Buzz, and, and he's too simple some pictures and we each had assigned objectives that we we were supposed to catch and I you know I think we probably caught a, a fair share of the things we were supposed to take uh, take pictures of and, and not too many really bad shots <laughs> I'm, I'm struck by coming down it had to be a lot of wonderment a lot of excitement as you took that last step onto the lunar surface. But then you guys went to work. And insofar as there are critics, they said, why did we send men to the moon? We should have sent up machines to gather up things. I was struck by something you said earlier about you know, when you're talking about geology. There's no computer in the world that can match the human eye and the human brain. And you, the things that you saw that you hadn't expected to see, that's what we can do. I mean, there's no machine in the world can do that. Machines are getting better and better, but fortunately there's still a place for us homo sapiens. <laughs> Some reason for us to continue to exist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, two things. I, mean, I guess we should mention. Uh, we jumped the story a little, but the when you, when the landing occurred, um, you had a pilot up to make sure that you didn't go into a crater. Um, how damaging would that have been if you couldn't and you landed in? Would that have been the end of the you know, the mission? Uh, we could have tried to land there, uh, and we might have gotten away with it. Uh, it was a, a fairly steep slope, and it was covered with very big rocks and just wasn't a good place to go. I, you know, if I'd run out of fuel, why well, I, I would have put down right there. But if I had any choice of a, a more promising spot, I was going to, uh, to take it. And uh, and uh, there were some attractive uh, areas, far far more level, far less uh, occupied by boulders and things a uh, half mile ahead or, or so, so that's where I, I went. I wanted to make it as easy for myself as I could. 
on that first. There's a lot of concern about the coming close to running out of fuel. And I was very cognizant of that. Uh, but I, I did know that uh, if I could have my speed stabilized and attitude stabilized, I could fall from a fairly good height, perhaps maybe 40 feet or more. And in the low lunar gravity, the gear would absorb that much uh, fall. So I, I was perhaps probably less concerned about it than a lot of people watching uh, down here on Earth. Uh, and uh, that's not to say I wasn't thinking about it, though, because I, I certainly was. But I thought it was important to try to try to get it down smoothly on the first try. We didn't know how that landing was actually going to go until that point, so I wanted to make it as, as gentle as I could. Was there anything about the, your moon walk and, and collecting of, of rocks and, and, and the like um, that surprised you at that time when you were on the moon? Like, I did not expect to encounter this. I did not expect it to look like this. Um, or in, included in that, the, the view of the rest of space from the moon must have been quite an awesome thing to, to experience. I was surprised by a number of things, and I'm not sure I can't recall them all now. I was surprised by the apparent closeness of the horizon. Uh, I was surprised by the trajectory of, of, of dust that you kicked up with your boot, and I was surprised that even though I, logic would have told me that there shouldn't be any, there was no dust when you kicked you never had a cloud of dust there. It doesn't it's a, that's a product of having an atmosphere. And when you don't have an atmosphere, you don't have any clouds of dust. Uh, I was absolutely dumbfounded when I shut the rocket engine off and the paths of particles that were going out radially from the, from the bottom of the engine belt all the way out over the horizon. And when I shut the engine off, they just raced out over the horizon and instantaneously disappeared. No, just like it had been shut off for a week. And that was remarkable. Never seen that. Never seen anything like that on it. Uh, and you know, logic says, yeah, that's the way it ought to be there. But uh, I hadn't thought about it. And I was surprised. And the, the collection of rocks that you gathered and things, were, those were pretty much what you expected. There was no we didn't do a very good job, and I particularly didn't do as good a job as I would have liked to have done in collecting rock samples. It was at the end of our, uh, our period on the surface, time period. Uh, we were running low on time, and uh, the geologists properly would have liked us to authenticate each sample with photographs from different directions and before selecting it and, and identify it. And I thought, uh, since we didn't have time to do it, the better part of Valor was to just pick up all the different kinds of samples I could as quickly as I could, stick them in the bag, and, uh, and get them back in the craft and, uh, and button up shop. When, when the American flag is planted on the moon, in, in the famous photograph of, I suppose, all there is a kind of light and other other places, mm -hmm. but the, the um, is that uh, just reflect on how important did you feel at that point in any? Um, I know it's so hard to put you back in that moment, really, but that this was now the the mission was accomplished that the United States had gone to the moon that all this work had counted. But in other words, there's such a patriotism with the flag there in the United States. On the other hand, you're looking at Earth is not it's one unity, mm -hmm. and there's sort of a pride of American nationalism, but also the sense of, geez, we're all in that little planet in the sky together. Um, uh, there were a lot of proposals for what to do on the lunar surface by different people. Uh, some people thought a UN flag should be there, and some people thought there should be flags of a lot of nations. Uh, in the end, uh, it, it was decided, and, and I think the Congress had something to do with it, that this was a United States project and we're not going to stake a claim here, but we ought to let people know that we were here and we put a U.S. flag. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, my job was uh, uh, get the flag there. And, uh, I was less concerned about whether that was the right uh, artifact to place. I, I'd let other wiser minds, wiser minds than mine, uh, make those kind of decisions, and I, I had no problem with it. When you finally, I guess, what was the most harrowing part of Apollo 11? Was it getting the lunar module off the moon and reconnect it to reconnect with Michael Collins? Is that the part of the mission that you were most concerned about? Well, uh, take that in two steps. Uh, we're no, fortunately, there were no really harrowing parts uh, of, of the flight. Uh, the, the most difficult part from my perspective, and the one that gave me the most pause, was the final descent to landing. It was far and away the most complex part of the, of the flight. The systems were very heavily loaded at that time. The unknowns were rampant. The, the systems in these, uh, in this mode had only been tested on Earth and never in the real environment. Uh, there were just a, a thousand things to worry about uh, in, the, in the final descent. It was, uh, I think, the, it was hardest for the system and it was hardest for the crews to complete that part of the flight successfully. But having said that, it wasn't too hard because six Six crews were successfully able to, to do that. So uh, perhaps my concern at that point was uh, more than more than it should have been. But it was the thing that I I worried about just because it was so difficult walking around on the surface. Uh, well, you know, on a ten scale was a one, and I thought that the, the lunar descent on a ten scale was probably a thirteen. <laughs> uh, I want to ask, I have heard or read somewhere that there are only two man-made objects on Earth that can be seen from the moon. And that one of these is a Chinese wall and the other is the Fort Peck Dam. I would, cha I would challenge both. Uh, the only uh, we could see uh, continents because in Greenland st stands out, looks like just like it does on the globe in your library, it's all white. Uh, Antarctica we couldn't see because there were clouds over Antarctica. Uh, out, Africa was quite visible and we could see uh, sun glint off a, off a lake. and might have been Lake Chad. I'm not certain which, uh, which lake it was, but we could catch that reflection, sun reflection off that. But I, I do not believe that, uh, at least with my eyes, would be any man-made object that I could see. And I, I have not yet found somebody who has told me they've seen the wall of China from Earth orbit. There might, there, I'm not going to say there aren't people, but I Personally, I haven't talked to them. I've asked various people, and particularly shuttle guys, that have been many orbits around China in the daytime. Uh, mm. And I haven't, the ones I've talked to, I didn't see it. I've, I've read interviews in, in which astronauts have used the word how fragile it is mm -hmm. looking at the Earth. Yeah, it's a lovely phrase, and I think uh, I think everybody shares that observation, and I don't know why you have that impression, but it's 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 so small, it's very colorful, and and it you know you see a ocean and a gaseous layer, a little bit of just a tiny bit of atmosphere around it. Uh, and uh, compared with all the other celestial objects, which uh, in many cases are much more massive, 
more terrifying. It just looks like uh, it couldn't put up a very good defense against the celestial onslaught. <laughs> Well, when you came back um, <coughs> and you had the, the quarantine and the, the well, let, let me, I mean, did you realize your life was going to be changed forever now? You were now the first man on the moon that people are going to, the President of the United States are going to talk with you and they want you to tour American cities and travel the world. And, um, I, don't, I don't know how much I, I don't remember how much I might have expected that, but uh, in uh, in Germany, uh, President Johnson had sent me on a goodwill tour of South America, so I had uh, some experience with what, what the nature of those kinds of uh, activities uh, were. And uh, of course, we were so so happy that we had uh, completed the that flight and, and essentially got almost all our objectives on it and it allowed uh, the guys in the next flight, subsequent flights, to uh, do far more uh, aggressive uh, science and, and exploration and so on. And so, you know, we didn't care what, what they wanted us to do. Uh, we'd been pleased to do anything at that point. You've had a, just as what I consider one of the most fascinating parts about your career is that why you were the absolute right person to be the first person on the moon because you haven't you kept the kind of um, dignity to your mission which is seems to me um, you know um, that you did your job and then you, you you did not keep in the face of public I, I don't your <coughs> Armstrong is known with Apollo 11 all over the world but I don't think anybody in a grocery store would recognize you in, in, in America, and that's something you must have had to work at to achieve. Well, uh, I, I recognize that uh, I'm portrayed as as, uh, as staying out of the, the public uh, eye. From my perspective, it doesn't seem that way because I do. I do so many things. I go so many places. I give so many talks. I write so many papers, and you know, I talk I, that. From my point of view, it seems like I don't know how I could do more. Uh, but I recognize that uh, from another perspective outside, I'm only able to accept less than 1% of all the requests that come in. So to them, it seems like I'm not doing anything. Uh, but that's, I, I can't change that. <laughs> but for the number of, I've seen that they have the number of, say, honorary doctorates you're offered and how few you take. Um, you know, and there's, you, you know, it's, it's, you know, you really are very select in, in what you do, you know, in, in, in that. And, and you also seem to it's, that, it's very difficult to turn down Sister Frances Marie. <laughs> <laughs> but you can turn Harvard down. You can turn down Sister Frances Marie. Um, the, well, after that, um, did you play any role, well, after you left the astronaut corps shortly after Apollo 11, you took the position of associate minister of aerospace? Mm -hmm. um, of 80. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's the, it's associate admin of, of, of uh, deputy associate administrator for aeronautics. aeronautics. So I went back to aeronautics from whence I came. Yes. And was that something you had premeditated all along that when I finished with this mission I'd like to get back to doing that? Or did it evolve after seeing uh -huh. a bit of the, uh, you wanted to get back to your roots in a way? Uh, no, 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 it didn't come that way. It wasn't anything I desired. Uh, was the administrator ask if, uh, if I would help him in that area. It was an area I felt comfortable with and knowledgeable about. And uh, I was glad to have the experience. So, Although I, I think everybody should have to go to Washington and spend a little time just to see how difficult it is to run this country uh, and do penance there. Uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's a bit frustra it's a frustrating place 
for me because uh, it's, it's so much coordination and greasing the skids goes on in Washington that by the time you get around to everybody, the for, first guy's forgotten what the subject was. <laughs> it's really hard to, to get things down there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's amazing to me that anybody can, can, can get things rolling from, from Washington. Just, just because of the nature of the place. You, let me ask, we're both academics. That's where I made my career. That's where Doug has made his career. You've been an academic. Uh, tell us about that. How did you decide to go to Cincinnati and then did you enjoy the teaching and the research and what part of the academic life was not what you expected it to be? Um, I always uh, said to colleagues and friends and that uh, one day I hope to go back to the university. I'd done a little teaching before, and uh, and there were a lot of opportunities, but uh, but the University of Cincinnati invited me to go there as a faculty member and pretty much uh, gave me carte blanche to do what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I spent nearly a decade there uh, teaching engineering. I really enjoyed it. I loved the teaching, loved the kids. Uh, only they were smarter than I was, which made it a challenge. <laughs> uh, uh, but I found uh, the governance uh, unexpectedly dif difficult, and uh, and and uh, I was poorly prepared and trained to uh, to uh, to handle handle some of the aspects of not the teaching, but just the, uh, the universities uh, are uh, operate differently than. The, the world I, I came from, uh, and uh, a after, you know, after uh, doing it, and actually I stayed in that jo job longer than any job I'd ever had up to that point, but I decided it was uh, it was time for me to go on and try some some other things. So, uh, well, dealing with administrators and then dealing with your colleagues, and, uh, I know, at, but Dwight Eisenhower was convinced to take the presidency of Columbia by Tom Watson mm -hmm. when he retired as chief of staff in 1948. And he once told me, he said, you know, I thought there was a lot of red tape in the Army. <laughs> 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 then I became a college president. <laughs> uh -huh. And he said, I thought we used to have awful arguments in the Army over who to put into what position. Have you ever been with a bunch of deans when they're talking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of constituencies with all with different perspectives, and and uh, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. And nevertheless, uh, it's one of the strengths of our country. And oh, I love being a teacher, and, and, and I'm, I never would have done it any other way. Uh, but I remember once, with some colleagues, and they were complaining about we don't get paid enough, and they're overworking us, and so on. And I just exploded. I said, "Listen, you, this was at LSU. You've got the state as your patron, and they're paying you to teach nine hours a week on exactly what you want to be doing, what you want to be teaching, and they're paying you to read." <laughs> exactly what you want to read in the literature of your field. And you're telling me that you're being <laughs> browbeaten? <laughs> and they could they never could get the point of what I was saying. I was curious, do you play any role in planning <coughs> at all after the Apollo 11 and Skylab or the shuttle, the space station, or even future missions to Mars? Um, not... Uh, not very much. Uh, I was on the Apollo 13 accident board, and during that time period is when I, uh, I was invited to uh, go up to Washington. So uh, then I 
was sort of overwhelmed by my new new duties uh, uh, in that in that new role, which which I which which I enjoyed, but gave me a little time to uh, to uh, be concerned about the problems that, of the day at at, at Houston. Do you, when you think of, do you, would you like to see us go to Mars? Yes. Do you think it's possible? I think, yes, I think it's doable now, but very expensive, and probably not within a uh, reasonable uh, expectation of, uh, of being able to be budgeted in the, in the near future now. I guess the great great hope is that we have a breakthrough someplace that uh, make that problem much much less uh, awesome than it appears at this point. Or space out the time a bit. It's not the Cold War anymore, and it's not a race. Yeah. So you could space out the time frame mm -hmm. and cut your annual cost quite a bit by doing that. I would think. Uh, still, it's still a big number. Still a big number. Big yeah. number, and uh, yeah, a big effort. I mean, yeah. it's it's got to be done. Yeah. Disappointed, Mr. Armstrong, after Apollo 11, after the halcyon days of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and now it's the early Nixon years, and you're doing the move that the Nixon administration started cutting NASA budgets, and there started to be due to Vietnam and other concerns in society. After a few, after Apollo 11 and all that interest, it started becoming almost commonplace to walk on the moon or people for NASA to go, and the program kind of petered out and lost interest. Instead of continuing to ride the the, the wave, what do you attribute that to? The, the oh, I think it's predominantly res the responsibility of the human character. We. we we don't have a very long attention span, and uh, and, uh, and needs and and uh, and pressures vary from from day to day, and uh, we have difficult time remembering a few months ago, or we have a difficult time looking very far into the future. We're we're very now oriented, and and uh, and I, I I'm not surprised by that. Uh, I think uh, it will, will always be in space, but uh, it will take us longer to do the new things than than we would than the advocates would like, and uh, in some cases it will take external factors or forces which we can't control and can't anticipate that will cause things to happen or not not happen. Nevertheless, uh, you know, looking back, uh, we were really very privileged to live in that thin slice of history where we we changed uh, how man looks at himself and and what he might become and where he might go and so uh, I'm very thankful that we got to see that and, and be part of it. Do you ever hope to go back into space? Is that something that you'd like to do one more time after watching John Glenn go back up recently? Is that they offered me command of a Mars mission. I'd jump at it. <laughs> but I read in one of the interviews that it, it, it's going to be two and a half years was one of the estimates. And that the proper models to look at are not Apollo 11, but look at Lewis and Clark of Vasco exactly. da Gama. Exactly. That's awfully good advice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Just, we're almost finished here, but I did want to touch on the um, Presidential Commission on the Challenger. Mm -hmm. And you were one of the commission members picked. How and when were you asked to participate on that? It was very soon after the, the uh, incident, and I can't remember the exact date, but it was just a matter of a few days Later, the uh, president uh, was very interested, and I shouldn't say interested, he, he was uh, content with the use of, of presidential commissions to look at various issues. 
and uh, sort of in keeping with that viewpoint that he had on how to look at various problems, he, he jumped at the uh, a chance to use a presidential commission. It was, uh, he, he selected Bill Rogers to, uh, to chair it and asked me to vice chair. Uh, uh, I had enormous uh, admiration for the way the chairman conducted his job. He sort of uh, had a very good appreciation of Washington and what the needs of the public and, and the press and the Congress and uh, all these constituencies who e each had their own interests from different angles. And, and uh, so he, he was able to understand what their needs were and try to find ways to accommodate them and ask me to, uh, to uh, head the, the investigation of, of the accident itself. So he was Mr. Outside and asked me to stay inside and, and come up with uh, what happened. We had 120 days to come out with our report, which we met. And uh, it was a very hard working commission. Uh, I think we came up with the right answers. It's never, never been effectively challenged. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a national tragedy. But uh, we learned a great deal from it, and, and uh, subsequent uh, shuttle program has benefited greatly from the things that we learned and the things that we were able to do in improving the shuttle during the time period that it was being redesigned. Were you very familiar with the shuttle program and the inner workings of NASA before you joined the commission, or have you kind of punched out into the private sector so much that you weren't? that much on top of what was happening? Uh, I didn't know the, uh, the inner workings of the shuttle systems and components. Uh, I knew the program in a, in a macro sense, uh, objectives and techniques and general strategies. But um, I didn't find that to be extreme disadvantage. Uh, we had the availability uh, on the commission and, and, and reporting to the commission of very knowledgeable people from every aspect of the technical side of the, the business and uh, didn't, uh, didn't take the commission long to, to get up to speed and understand what the elements of the problem were. Well, the Apollo program closed in 1972. Does it surprise you that we haven't gone back to the moon in so long, and that we're? Um, did you ever imagine that? I mean, it would take so long for people to return, for us to return. Well, had had you asked me that question uh, 30, 30 years ago, I probably would have said, "No, I can't imagine that we'll make the the uh, such a small number of steps over the next." three decades. Uh, but looking back on it, I, I find it fairly understandable in the light of conflicting requirements for resources that the country country has and has a lot of other important challenges. Uh, I, I suspect that uh, we'll, we'll get some chances. And there have been remarkable things done. If you look back and predict, see uh, where where we've gone and uh, and the unmanned side, the probes that we've we've investigated, uh, the outer planets and and uh, and comets that landed on an astro asteroid and and uh, just done not opened up. Uh, with the with the Hubble and and, and others, uh, the known volume of our uh, of our environment by millions of light years, it's remarkable what what have happened in the last thirty years, and I think we'll get some more chances. Do you, in Ohio, do you have your own telescope? Do you ever look up and use your telescope? You know, more recreational. Um, I uh, I have one. Uh, it's not uh, not very high quality, but uh, 
and uh, and now my my son has uh, been a lot of time looking at that. When you were talking about how remarkable it was, but been done. This has been pretty remarkable too. Yes, indeed. And that's a political development. Yeah, yeah. That would have been unpredictable in 1969. Yeah, that's quite true. That's yeah. quite true. Well, in closing here, and I said, I just wanted to ask you, do you, what do you see for the future of man and unmanned space flight? Do you have any feelings of where it's headed? Maybe better questions: Where would you like to see? man and unmanned space flight had to keep pushing the envelope? There's, a, there's an increasing interest to go back to the moon. There's been enough time now that there are a lot of persuasive reasons why uh, we could benefit from a return visit. I personally uh, hope that we'll, we'll go on to Mars. I think that will, uh, that will create enormous excitement and increased understanding of at least the near part of the solar system. Um, and, uh, but I can't predict what will happen. Uh, what, what happens is going to depend on, on uh, a variety of forces and functions that, uh, that uh, can't, be, can't be controlled. It's like herding cats. Although you're an engineer and proud of it, do you ever use your imagination for like reading science fiction books or, or trying to envision what it might be like a thousand years from now or 500 years from now or 200? Or do you try to always deal with what seems to be the next step in the practical realm? I'm having a little trouble with next month right now. <laughs> uh, it's fine to look, a look ahead, but uh, candidly, I... Uh, I don't have the ability that some of those wonderful uh, science fiction writers of past generations have had. They turned out to be quite perceptive in, in many ways, and I, I wish I had a fraction of that ability. Are there any of them in particular that you regret, like a Jules <coughs> or somebody that you learned to admire in retrospect their writing? Well, I, ha I have a a complete set of H.G. Wells, and uh, in reading it now, uh, I find I'm less enthusiastic about his writings than I was when I was a young, much younger man. But nevertheless, uh, the the uh, creative ideas that uh, that they have put forth that uh, have caused thousand billions of, of other people to think in new ways has been very important to the progress of civilization. Do you ever get, um, when these movies come out like Star Wars or these sort of space films, are you attracted to watching them just to see, you know, how, how they're portraying space in the future? Is that, you take the time to, like your curiosity just to see, look at those sort of things? I, I thought 2001, which is dec many decades ago now, was a very fine film, very uh, authentic in terms of its uh, uh, the way space looks and, and the way vehicles move and trajectories and so on. Uh, the more many of the more recent uh, uh, space fiction movies have much less realism than than 2001 did. They're more exciting, but uh, not realistic. Students ask me, doctors, there's nothing left to discover. <laughs> We've had Lewis and Clark. We've had Magellan, and so on. And, uh, and I say, listen, the 21st century is going to be the, the great age of discovery. 97% of the ocean's floors have never been looked at. Where Bob Ballard is right now is just the cutting edge of it. Yeah and Mars, and then who knows what after that. The 21st century is going to be the great age of discovery. I think you're right. I hope you're right. I hope I too. But my expectation is that yeah. we're not going to run out of new stuff to look at. No. 96% of the world's plants have never been described by a botanist. 
I didn't know that. It's just amazing. Well, you want to cure for Alzheimer's? There, it's growing out there. I'd be out there. <laughs> we just haven't discovered it yet. Well, a little quick story on that. Thomas Jefferson was a great believer in for every disease of mankind, there's a cure growing here on Earth. We just got to find it. Mm -hmm. So he, one of his instructions to Lewis was, tell us what those Indians use for medicine. His, uh, Lewis's mother was a uh, folk doctor, herbs and so mm -hmm. So Lewis, uh, from Fort Mandan, the first winter out, wrote back to Jefferson to report on what had been discovered so far. He said, when the Indians get a toothache, they chew the bark of the willow. The bark of the willow is aspirin. That's all the world aspirin is, is the bark of the willow. I didn't know that. Yeah, and Lewis. So I know there's a plant out there that's going to cure Alzheimer's. I just don't know what the name of the plant is. I was wishing, I think, that way to wrap this up. My last question, and it's, it's you've seemed to have always gone through your life um, in your own kind of very methodical way. And you've had a lot of people that have been part of your team or you've worked with. But has, never, has there ever been an individual who's really it had a major effect on the way that you decided to look at life and the way that you want to live your life and carry yourself, um, whether it was a teacher or a father or... Is there uh, I, th I think it's the uh, summation of the influence of uh, 20 or 50 people, uh, each of which was significant but not overpowering. of our team as a team is that usually, because we're all oral historians, at the end of our oral history, the person who is facilitating usually asks the rest of the team members, because sometimes some issues might come up that we didn't get a chance. Would you object if I ask our space historians if they have a question or two for you? Okay. Do you have, do you have any issues? I have a couple questions, actually. Early on, you mentioned that during the space program, you were 98% focused on your job. But I was curious as to how much you were aware of situations in the country around you as you were going about your daily job. So much was going on in the 60s, and whether that impacted you at all. Um, I, I was certainly aware of uh, of the traumas that the country was experiencing at, at that time. Uh, and I believed uh, that those problems were ones that, with which I was w poorly equipped to contribute. Uh, they, were, they were outside my experience, outside my training, and uh, I've always believed that, uh, however uh, attractive it might be to get into areas that are interesting, uh, you shouldn't do it if you're not qualified. <laughs> the other question I wanted to follow up on was you had mentioned that you were involved for a short time in the Apollo 13 investigation before you went to DC. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to follow up and ask, first, while the mission was going on, if you had any involvement during those efforts, and then what your specific involvement was in the yeah. investigation. I think every everybody that was here uh, was involved. Uh, and not just crew members, but there were people all, all over the center that were involved in many ways. Uh, I was involved in simulator work uh, and uh, in several different things that we were trying to do, alignments and burns and things that were outside our experience base in the, in the past. And there were a lot of uh, people doing that. Uh, I'm reminded of the Apollo 13 movie, which I thought was exceptionally good movie. Uh, re thought in all, all the essential elements uh, of the that 
that flight and its aftermath that they were accurate. Uh, they did take literary license, and appropriately so, because there's no way an audience can can follow as many people as we had working on the problem. You have to cut it down to some 10 or 15 people so that the audience can remember who's doing what. And uh, I thought they did a good job of that. But each of those one individuals that was doing something in the movie was probably really 15 people doing that kind of stuff. And after the accident then, what was your um, involvement in the investigation to what happened? And uh, those findings? Uh, as I said, uh, in the middle of that investigation, I got transferred out to Washington and no longer participated in the day-to-day -day, uh, activities of that commission. But uh, they had good people, and they and they did they did come up with the with the answers. And had quite a successful rest of the program. Yeah. That was all the questions I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a couple too. Uh, while we're talking about the investigation boards, um, <coughs> you gave us a, an overview of your involvement with the Challenger uh, mm -hmm. uh, Presidential Commission. And one of the things that's been said about that is. The Challenger investigation was very different than Apollo 1 uh, because that was sort of an internal That's investigation right. that kept the politics out of it. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the NASA guys we've talked to said that was really a better way to do it than the way Challenger was handled. Mm -hmm. Could you give us your perspective as someone who was around for both of those events? Um, I, I agree with those gentlemen that uh, it would have been preferable to do it uh, internally, and I think it could have been done well. But the reality was that uh, it was a national involvement. Uh, it was so striking. It was on the news. Uh, everybody in the country saw that happen, or at least saw the replay of it in the news that day. And uh, the possibility of keeping it uh, internal was was remote. And. Uh, I, I, I'm happy that the commission t took a diligent uh, respo responsibility and uh, acted, I think, in a responsible manner and uh, did a credible job of spending a lot of money and finding out what happened and probably it was well, well spent. Well, during the course of the investigation, you probably had a good chance to see what NASA was like in the mid-1980s, you know, internally, how, how they were functioning. Can you compare that to the NASA you had left, you know, over a decade earlier in the 1970s? Um, NASA, like many organizations, is a continually evolving uh, character. It, 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 uh, it centralizes and then decentralizes and centralizes and then it decentralizes and then probably in my recollection, probably went through five cycles like that. And uh, when the new guy comes in, why well, he thinks we ought to do something a little different than we have, and so it changes the reporting relationships or the responsibilities uh, allocation. And uh, it's no different in the in the commercial world. They do similar things in industry, uh, go through the same cycles, and uh, and that's not neither right nor, nor wrong. It's just the way things are. Well, then I had uh, a few specific questions. Uh, one of the gentlemen we had in here uh, some months ago was Bob Carlton, who was a flight controller uh, who was in the left mm -hmm. control console. And he was recalling uh, the, uh, the lunar landing and the events shortly thereafter where he and his colleagues were having a, a quite a few moments of tension because there was a problem with the LEM descent engine. There was a you know, a piece of ice stuck in one of the fuel lines, and so they were yeah. thinking some real problems were going on. I was wondering if you could give us your perspective, what you knew in the, uh, what, sitting there in the LEM, and what you knew of what was going on uh, on the ground. Well, uh, we were uh, spring-loaded to the uh, suspicion position uh, at that point. We recognized that right after landing, where you had to do thermal condition surrounding uh, the craft that it hadn't seen before with all that hot 
surface underneath it and cold on top and that we're going to be all kinds of conceivable difficulties with plumbing and valves and, and pressure systems and relief valves and so on so uh, we were we were ready to leave if we if we had to and uh, we were listening carefully to their their instructions but uh, I can't I can't remember the details of what we were thinking at that point in time. We're at least concerned enough that, yeah, we might have to actually abort and end up on. We, uh, we didn't, uh, we were quite cognizant of the fact that we might have to do that, and we were prepared to do so, and we were going through all the procedures that will allow us to do so if we were, if we were required. But uh, I think the problem was, was uh, isolated in a reasonably short period of time, as I remember, and uh, and the and, and the pressure was off to to uh, really start sweating out a takeoff. Well, like I said I think the guys on the ground ended up a lot more nervous than uh, than you and Buzz did in the LEM. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, once you uh, got it, got out of the LEM and you're going down the ladder, what's your you're in this environment uh, that requires you to have a spacesuit. I mean, you've got to have this protective garment on to keep both, you know, in some internal pressure and protect you from micrometeoroids and heat in, uh, in the cold space, all of that. How did actually functioning in this suit uh, compare to how you were trained for it? I mean, what were some of the, the difficulties in, in operating on the moon with this, learning to walk around, pick up rocks, all of that? Everything was easier. I expected it was easier to walk. It was easier to keep maintain balance. Uh, we didn't have as much trouble with with temperatures inside the suit as we thought thought we might have. Uh, can hardly say good enough things about the way the suit and the the back to back the so called press uh, operated and uh, fully fully up to our uh, expectations and. And better. Had you had any input in uh, in the development of the suit, uh, other than you know, your usual training, that sort of thing? Uh, not 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 so much in the development of the suit, no. But we had participated in a lot of testing, and uh, it's been a lot of many 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 hours inside the our suits uh, be, before flight in the chamber and under vacuum and temperature and all kinds of conditions. So uh, I, we felt pretty comfortable uh, and, and, comp and confident that uh, the suits were going to work okay. And on all the flights, I don't think they had a single problem with any of the suits, uh, at least that was mission critical of any suits. I'm, I'm not aware of any serious problem. And just one final question for me. Uh, <clears throat> as our colleagues pointed out here earlier, you seem to you know, take great pride in being an engineer. So I, want, I was wondering that through your career as an astronaut, how much time did you find to actually be able to do engineering types of things? I mean, to get your your hands or your minds around the, these engineering sort of, sorts of problems that, that you would be facing as either as a flight crew member or in some other technical assignment. Um, I'd say through throughout uh, my 17 years at NACA and NASA, I, uh, a very large percentage of my time was involved in real engineering work uh, throughout that entire time period. Uh, and I found that uh, uh, other former engineers who had become senior managers at NASA still occasionally tried to be engineers now and then. <laughs> I guess a follow-up to that just before we go on. Uh, did you uh, have an, have much work with uh, Max Faget and his and uh, everyone over in Engineering and Development uh, Directorate? Um, some of the guys in the in the office had more work with that directorate than I did. My my uh, collateral responsibility usually was in the simulation and training area, so I, I had I spent more time with FCOD than I did with Max's gang, but uh, others spent a lot of time there. Okay. Right, that was all I had. Thank you. I had a couple. Um, I, 
if I may ask you to reflect again on Gemini 8. Um, in, in history, uh, we find that uh, Gemini 8 tends to be overshadowed by later things and the Gemini program as a whole even. Um, but as we've talked to so many people, engineers and people that work in mission control, oftentimes ask them about the, they, they cite Gemini 8 as probably uh, the closest call, overshadowing even Apollo 13. Um, in light of what was accomplished in that mission, the docking, which was so um, important, and then the, the critical incident of a nearly fatal craft malfunction, um, yet the human element able to overcome that malfunction. What were the consequences of that for the Gemini program and the later program, and maybe the lessons learned from that important mission? Well, uh, the requirement was to fix that so it didn't happen again, and they did alter the systems such uh, they changed the wiring on the control system so that they could isolate all that 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 kind of systems uh, and and uh, allowed a, a more uh, deliberate uh, uh, evaluation or diagnosis uh, of of the problem so that uh, that was the that was the hardware side uh, to me, it re-emphasized the fact that you know you got to expect some of these things are going to go wrong, and and uh, we always need to uh, prepare ourselves for handling the the unexpected, and uh, you just hope those unexpected things aren't something that you can't cope with. So, uh, in throughout Apollo, everybody I knew was always saying, "What if? I mean, is it possible that this could happen?" And uh, what will we do? And just that process of continually questioning uh, builds your confidence in your ability to handle whatever comes along. And I had one, uh, one more, a um, little bit broader perspective question. Um, I'm from a generation that has no living memory of the Apollo program. What we learn is from watching the videotapes, what's written in history. Um, and you talked about how you, you enjoy teaching students. What would you like people of my generation and those to come that don't have a memory of uh, the space program during the time you were involved? What would you like for us to take from, from that part of history? I can't be critical of your generation because uh, I recall when I was a teenager or a boy, I thought that everything that happened before I was born was old, ancient history. And I really uh, didn't think I needed to know all about it. But uh, it, it, with respect to aviation history, I really enjoyed it. I really <laughs> wanted to learn, learn all I could, but I wasn't a big fan necessarily of, uh, of everything else. And so I, I, can't, be, I can't be critical of, of, uh, of some other generation. I, I suspect you'll come along, give a little chance. <laughs> it's, it's fat. If you have no more, I certainly would like to thank you, gentlemen, on behalf of the Johnson Space Center and Mr. Abbey for taking your day and spending it with our project. You certainly have made a historic impact on our project, and we thank you all for your time. <laughs>